Hello everybody, Simon Dixon here. Welcome to another episode of Bitcoin Hard Talk. Today we're going to be discussing SBF found guilty upon seven counts. Now, this is bittersweet for many of us. Uh, me personally, um, I think it's a tragic story when a 31-year-old that stole billions and was so dishonest with uh, people's money um, is tragically found himself in a situation uh, where they're going to spend the rest of their life in prison. Um, so many victims, so much losses along the way, and took so many elements of the industry down with it as well. Um, on the other side, it actually exposed a bunch of fraud, took out a bunch of fraud in our industry, allows our industry to move on, um, and uh, also exposed all the other frauds that were building on top of this fraud um, that was cascading fraud, as it were. Um, but yesterday it was announced, um, and immediately after it was announced, I joined a Twitter space, and uh, the Twitter space was absolutely fascinating. Um, so I shared uh, my thoughts around the SPF scenario, um, and we had uh, amazing guests, um, some people that had done time and were sharing their experience about what this is going to be like for SBF once we know how long he is going. Um, they also shared how long they think he's going down. You know, the highest was life, and there was other forecasts in between. Um, and so it's a it's a longer Twitter space, uh, but uh, enjoy it. I think you're gonna um, enjoy the understanding a little bit more about it. Um, and it impacts our industry, as I said, it's a tragic story. Um, it took down, you know, but uh, the the one good thing is that I went into how the FTX bankruptcy is actually not going to be so financially disastrous for creditors if it continues along its existing path. Um, there has been a silver lining. You know, uh, this week, uh, we've uh, we've seen, it's been a crazy week. We've had escalations in uh, the global warfare at the moment that is happening in the Middle East, which is going to, is tragic, disastrous. Um, we've had the conclusion of the SBF case uh, where he's found guilty on those seven counts. Uh, we had the confirmation hearing for the Celsius network bankruptcy. Um, that's coming to an end. I'll be giving my final video and final space on that matter um, next Friday for those of the Celsius creditors. Uh, but this one is all about uh, SBF. So for those of you that didn't follow the trial, um, it was a slam dunk, essentially. Uh, you know, SBF surprised everyone by taking the stage, got caught lying in front of court, uh, which obviously led to his guilty. Um, his case was really that the lawyers didn't tell me it was illegal to uh, spend up to $14 billion of client money by managing both a hedge fund, Alameda Research, and an exchange, FTX, giving um, FTX uh, the ability to lend with a $65 billion limit to Alameda and then Alameda using that in order to buy politicians, buy regulators, uh, buy ex you know, um, extravagant uh, marketing like uh, sponsoring arenas um, and paying Hollywood stars and $150 million and billion dollar contracts and um, all sorts of number, numbers, which are just absolutely insane. Um, and uh, that led to, at its peak, a $14 billion hole with a balance sheet of Alameda saying FTX borrow. Um, and uh, when some of the clients, you know, uh, because it was borrowed from FTX or borrowed, um, even though there was no contracts there, um, that was theft of client money. It's a crime, it's fraud. Um, is wrong on so many levels. And uh, because of that, that is why SBF is going to prison. The co-conspirators, the four other co-founders or people that were brought into the board, they all pleaded guilty and worked out with the FBI um, probably how to reduce their sentences by cooperating and giving uh, the, the, the Department of Justice everything they needed to get this um, guilty. Now, SBF denies um, saying he didn't know it was uh, illegal. He blamed his ex-girlfriend, Caroline Ellison, uh, for the problems, and he blamed all his other team members. Um, and so that was really his defense, but he got caught lying, and the evidence was 
indisputable and irrefutable. There was, uh, I believe, 12 jury members. They had to unanimously agree a guilty vote on each one, um, and it didn't take them long after the closing um, remarks uh, from both the defense and uh, uh, SBF's counsel um, and, uh, yeah, the different sides in order to summarize that. Um, I did a thread in Twitter, which I'll make sure is in the description, where Laura Shin um, has been doing some amazing work, going to court every day and summarizing it. There was about 15 different videos, that those that want to geek out. Um, this also closes a part of my book that I've been writing for the last two and a half years. Uh, we get conclusion on the uh, SBF um, and FTX saga. Um, and uh, yeah, but uh, for those that want to listen to this space, I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to closing this chapter. So without further ado, uh, let's move, move over to the recording of the Twitter space, uh, which happened in real time right after uh, SBF was charged guilty of seven counts. I'll see you on the other side. I'm going to bring you up to stage. Oh, Tatum's here too, but Tatum's not talking, which is normally not the issue. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Hey, are we, we're guilty across the board? We're about to find out. Uh, I think all three ago. counts are guilty. So, no, no, oh, whoa, so surprising. coming in right now. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Count one, guilty. Count two, guilty. Count three, guilty. Count four guilty, count five guilty, count six guilty, count seven guilty. Jesus so Christ. So, so basically Bernie made off and he'll probably get life. Or are we saying 20 to 30 years? I don't know, man. Uh, Mark would know. He's been following this very closely. But Mark's not Mark's not taking off his speaker, even though the people need his, his intel. <clears throat> Mark is an executive editor at Coindesk and has been there since 2015. He was a former editor-in-chief at American Banker. So if anyone knows this space, it's this guy. And he is Ian Allison's boss for quite a while. Uh, Ian Allison broke the story, of course, uh, on this whole situation. So he's been paying attention to it. Added Dennis to Sage also. If you're interested or you know a lot about the case, feel free to raise a hand and jump up on stage. We're just chronicling what is happening right now with seven guilties or whatever it was across all of them. It's just insane. You can see the, in the top in the uh, thing I shared up there to take a look at it. Adding some more people stage. How you doing, Dennis? Hey, what's going on, Will? Um, glad to be up here on the day that justice has been served. Uh, we could all start to move beyond all of this incredibly destructive bullshit that SPS has caused, not only in markets, but also um, with many of our political leaders as mm -hmm. well. So glad to see that we're moving past this. It's just starting. Mark is just texting me right now. Uh, he's a mentally healthy person and doesn't have Twitter on his phone, so he can't speak right now. But he's also filing the story with Coindesk. So just from a Coindesk perspective, like I'm a Coindesk alum, and it's it's crazy and awesome to see crypto media just get a huge win. I think a lot of people talk about self-regulation. Dennis, like you started up an entire company, like a, not a company, but a, a nonprofit to work on that. And Coindesk, I think, has a leading example of actually pulling it off. So it's pretty crazy. Uh, but, you know, Mike's been kind of ringing the bell on on Binance. Dennis, you've been working with a lot of Bitcoin miners, make sure they're healthy. It's been pretty crazy to see you guys work on that. Um, decrypting, I saw you up, turn on your mic. Feel free to jump in there. Yo, 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 hi, bro, hi, bro. It's nice having me on your space. So what's going on here? Uh, SBF is going to jail for a real long time. That's that's what's going to happen. So I'm not sure quite what the sentencing is. That's actually what I'm most curious about. And I'm trying to look at the inner city press. For, for those who don't follow inner city press, uh, this guy is a legend. He has a tiny office inside like the federal courthouse in New York and he covers everything and lots of crypto goes across his desk 
And if you follow him, you'll know about everything that's happening in uh, relating to like federal cases and crypto because he's been the guy covering it forever. And so it's crazy to see him pop up again. But yeah, we're we're looking at the the guilty counts, seven counts across the board. Um, Judge Kaplan, who's a the judge for this case, thanking the jurors for them participating. Uh, it was funny reading a lot of like the testimony from this for quite a while. A lot of the jurors were pretty tired and like falling asleep in their chairs, not wanting to participate, even though they were dealing with all this. Uh, it, it's been a long case for a lot of people who were a part of this. And a lot of people didn't know what was going on at all. Like there were some people who like had no idea how crypto worked. Um, so they had to be explained how like to send a transaction, how an exchange works in crypto, all that sort of stuff. And, and they went through the hard work and now we have guilty on seven counts, which I think is kind of crazy that they went from having to educate these jurors to even understanding what crypto is to now them coming across and handing seven guilty charges. I think that just shows you how pathetic SBF's case was uh, in general. Through Jason, uh, an invite to jump up on stage, see a few other familiar faces if you're interested or if you've been following the case feel free to send an invite up on stage uh we're just kind of reacting to whatever's going on with with sbf right now dennis you said you haven't been following the case too closely i'm surprised would, that's the case i would say like the actual like you know the trial i haven't been following closely because it's you know it's sort of like yeah we already know what's going to happen we know where these things are going um you know and i'm glad that there was just no way out for him. And that's that's the only thing that I can say that I'm happy about. I mean, this guy was incredibly destructive from the very beginning. Um, even before even before SBF collapsed, or excuse me, FTX collapsed, you know, his work was causing problems across the country, in particular in the political space. Um, like in my home state of Oregon, yeah. there was a candidate here that he funded, a no-name candidate, nobody knew who the hell he was. He was they started dubbing him the Manchurian candidate for the crypto space because SBF poured uh, I, I can't know the, I don't know the exact number, but it was like more than all the other candidates combined. What they were raising, he was he just one person was funding this guy. So um, automatically off the cuff, everyone in Oregon is like, oh, these crypto people, they're trying to come in, they're trying to take over government. And that was before any problems at FTX. So incredibly destructive, never liked the guy, glad he's getting what he deserves uh, because not only did he cause problems for so many people across this country, um, he really put a bad taste in the mouth for those in the political space. Um, and he's also forcing a lot of folks, uh, you know, I've, I've been trying working really hard with Democrats to get them on board with Bitcoin. And because he threw so much money at Democrats, now they're having to like walk away from crypto and Bitcoin and stay very far away from it um, to try to save face. And so, yeah, I just, I just can't, I can't say enough how happy I am that we're moving beyond this chapter and that this guy is gone. Um, just the amount of trouble and problems he caused out, on top of the outright fraud um, which is disgusting. I think there's nothing more abhorrent than than taking money from individual humans um, and literally lighting it on fire. Like, listen, you want to go, you want to go take money from some other big institution. You want to go take money from a large hedge fund. Like, listen, I don't support it, but I'm not going to be pissed. I'm going to be real pissed when you start taking money out of people's bank accounts and lighting it on fire and letting them believe that you're actually doing something good for them. And then all, the whole time using that money for God knows what, and telling everybody that you're some sort of like philanthropic genius and that you really are here to save the planet. I mean, everything about this guy is the opposite of, you know, what I strive for personally to be like in life and what I, what I hope Americans on average would strive for. Um, and, and so, yeah, just, uh, I, I hope you can, you can get my sense of why I'm not watching the trial. Cause I'm so just uh, frustrated and disgusted, uh, by this guy and glad that he, he got what he deserved and that the jury came back and found him guilty on all seven charges. They will. I posted just a quick tweet for basic information since the very next thing is, you know, the, the sentencing guidelines. I guess there's five counts that carry a 20 year max sentence and two that carry a five. I assume there's going to be some negotiation on that. There's going to be a lot of people writing letters attesting to Sam's wonderful character and the fact that he didn't know and that he's never committed a previous crime. So I, I'm assuming it'll get lopped down to something like what Theranos was, right? Which a lot of people felt was was not enough time given the harm caused, but to Dennis's point, given how many retail people were hurt here, I just I just 
feel like people would be disappointed if it's less than 20 to 30 years, but obviously it could be a life sentence if they actually follow the max sentencing guidelines, which would take it out to, you know, like 110 years, something like that. Jeez, that is, that is a lot. So I'm going to read your tweet. In terms of sentencing guidelines, the five money laundering and wire fraud counts carry maximum sentences of 20 years each. The two securities and commodities fraud charges carry five-year max sentences. Judge Kaplan makes the call. And I saw someone else respond to a tweet that we put out for the spaces itself saying sentencing will be in three months after pre-sentencing report if guilty. So he's guilty. So we have to wait three months, I suppose. Is that what I'm understanding from that tweet? Um, the crazy thing is also, isn't there like more s- stuff coming on in March, right? Because there's another set of charges from like the SEC and other organizations. So like, it's not even that, like there, there's more coming for this guy. Um, I saw uh, Naraj at Coin Center tweet out that he thought SBF was going to skate by this round and you know maybe get a fat check from some VC and go reboot with a great story. But my first thought my, about that was like, there's going to be more coming in March uh, with the additional stuff. You know, this puts the final nail in the coffin, though, for all of these conspiracy theorists on crypto Twitter who are like, well, he gave all his money to Democrats, so he'll definitely get off. Like, the, the, <laughs> the justice system is, is fucked. Like, he, he committed all these crimes, and he's actually going to go to jail. Um, and he won't be the only crypto founder to end up in jail, right? There are several others that are in jail, two or three others right now that are in jail that a lot of people said six or nine months ago this would never happen. Um, so this idea that there's some vast conspiracy to protect people that have given money to democratic uh, politicians is obviously a total farce at this point. Is it bull market time now? <laughs> or is it too early to talk about that? <laughs> ETC uh, perked up just a little bit the moment that the verdict became public information. So uh, I'm imagining that a lot of institutional investors who are piling in right now in advance of the BlackRock and the ETF approval will welcome this because for the most part, PMs don't want to touch these assets because of the headline risk. Last thing you want to do is tell a manager, right? Like you're a PM or an analyst and you say, hey, I'm really bullish on Bitcoin. I'm really bullish on Bitcoin miners. And then the next day, there's some terrible headline about SBF, keeping in mind that the average person can't parse the difference between SBF and Bitcoin. Right to them, it's all the same. Dogecoin, SPF, and Bitcoin is literally all one thing. It's all crypto. Um, that's why your friends and family call you to make sure you're okay when SPF got arrested, even though it has nothing to do with most of, most of us. So for sure, putting this behind us and kind of sweeping it under the rug makes it easier for institutions to allocate capital into this next bull run. So I would say, like, the bull run's already started, but this definitely is an additional uh, tailwind, in my opinion, uh, in terms of optics in terms of perspective in terms of institutional ability to allocate quickly without the headline risk that was there before let's go i just added ash to stage as well he uh runs many many things at real vision oh i think he just dropped off i think he hit the wrong button also added psycho train to stage to stage if you've been following the case pretty closely feel free to uh, send up a speaker request trying to get some details about like what the sentencing means and if you have any familiarity with all that i think mike and dennis put some good context in there already if you go into the top there's some tweets that were put up there but ash i think you're back up on stage hey guys what's going on thanks for having me up you watching everything pretty crazy Totally. I don't know how much Real Vision has been. You guys mostly focus on investments, but have you guys been following the SBF case pretty closely from Real Vision's perspective? Oh, yes, very, very much. Uh, and I just actually wrote a book about uh, Sam Bankman Fried and the collapse of FTX. Um, so this is a case that um, I've been watching extremely closely. I actually co wrote the book with uh, one of our Real Vision, one of my Real Vision colleagues, uh, Archer Osinski, who's a producer on my show at Real Vision. Uh, and Elizabeth Bachman, and this is a case that we've been unpacking and dissecting and thinking about a great deal. And uh, my gosh, what an incredibly quick turnaround on the verdict. I feel like a lot of people are su- surprised uh, by just how quickly that happened. But you know, this is a this is a pretty extraordinary moment. I think there's a you know, my first reaction to this is 
this is kind of the the official decoupling of the now we can say Sam Bankman freed fraud from the broader crypto space. I mean, you know, the I just tweeted out that the word alleged has gone the way of the dodo bird. You don't have to say alleged crime. This is now he's been convicted uh, of all counts in this case, which is a pretty striking statement as well. And, um, you know, it is it is quite clear that the the values that Sam Bankman Fried and FTX represented were not the values of crypto. In fact, they were the mirror image opposite of the values of decentralization, permissionlessness, um, and eliminating third party bottlenecks in the system that were run by corporations and individuals. So it's a it's a powerful moment for the space. Um, it's uh, it's a, a repudiation of everything that FTX stood for. And um, it's I think uh, it's a good moment for crypto because an incredibly bad actor, I think if we can say that now, has been convicted by a jury of his peers. I liked what you said there, Ash. I think the most important you know thing I would take away is that this guy has nothing to, you know, it, he might have been operating within the Bitcoin and crypto space, but he's completely out of alignment with us. And in fact, I don't think you need to look any further than the fact that the guy was shorting Bitcoin, you know, anything over 20K, he was shorting it. So, um, you know, really great point there. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it's a it's just a it's a it's a big moment, I think, for the space. And we're going to have to see how how price reacts in the wake of this conviction. Um, you know, if anybody's listening and they're interested in, in learning more about the backstory on Sam Bankman Fried, because, look, this is a really unusual guy with a really unusual history. He's not someone that was ever especially passionate about Bitcoin, about um, decentralization. This was a guy who, and listen, I don't mean this as a slur, he was a trader. He was a guy who was looking for an asset to trade into and out of uh, for profits. So, you know, some of my close friends make money uh, doing exactly that, but this was not somebody who ever had any real passion uh, for Bitcoin, for crypto, for decentralization, for any of the things that people in this space care most about. And um, we tell that whole backstory in my, in my book. It's called uh, Crypto Crunch. It's on uh, Amazon right now if uh, anyone's interested in it, but it's an incredible story. Uh, and to see how it ended, it's um, a pretty powerful statement, I think, for the space more broadly. And Ash, like some of his stuff was just made up too. It was like complete bullshit. Like the the trading he did between Japan and all that stuff, like that came out through the trial and through like investigations afterwards. That this guy kind of like had a marketing deal behind him to get it to get Alameda where it was. It, how much of that is true? How much have you looked into that sort of part of it, or anyone else on stage? If you've seen that. Well, you know, it seems as though there that he may have made those trades cross border. The extent to which they were what he represented them to be, I think, is very much an open question. But, you know, look, Sam, one of the things that, you know, I think most of the people who are listening, I know all, all the folks who are on stage in this uh, Twitter spaces, X spaces are very familiar with the story. But for people who are just viewing this on, you know, on CNN or whatever, one of the most interesting questions that came up is like, wow, that's an unusual looking guy. He's got this, you know, kind of uh, massive hairdo and and he wears T-shirts and shorts. And one of the things that we uncovered in our book, to your point, Will, was that this was very much a constructed image. You know, at, at one point he said to one of his and we document this in the book, he said to one of his colleagues, like one of his colleagues was like, dude, you, know, you, you got to put on a suit and look like a respectable individual if you're going in to meet with people. And he said, oh, no, it's positive expected value for me. To look this way. In other words, he was using the image, according to his own representations, to further this perception of himself as a mad genius. And, you know, it's it's very intentional, it's very deliberate. And now we can say Sam Bankman Fried is a convicted felon. Really quick before I throw it over to some other people I see on stage, I see Matt Walsh down in the listener section. Uh, I don't know if he's going to join us, but definitely give him a follow. He's had a lot of great tweets and insights from his perch over at Castle Island around not SBF, but also not only SBF, but many other uh, perceived and real frauds within the space. So if he'd join us, that'd be sick. But also you can just give him a follow just in case Matt Walsh again. Um, I see a few other people's hands up below G and Psycho Train, a few others. So feel free to jump in there. I have. I have uh, three things, four things to say. First of all, we gotta we gotta give a round of applause 
to all of the people in here for actually giving like having a release uh some hormone release uh towards the sbf case because like honestly fuck that guy he deserves jail and he deserves to rot in there second thing i want to say is that there there was a book that i really like uh it's called the hard money that you can't fuck with uh it's a very very good book it talks about bitcoin it explains bitcoin and it explains the fundamentals of bitcoin so i really really recommend it and third thing i want to say is that are we going to pump and fourth thing i was uh, i was going to say um are you guys going to get in on the ftx 2.0 and if not why what is your reasons and if you are also why and what is your reasons so you actually bring up a really interesting conversation which i i put a tweet up in the nest from michael mcsweeney who's the editor-in-chief over at um blockworks and michael's also a great follow uh super smart guy been in the space forever so definitely go give him a follow also and he said quote i'm gonna add Martin to stage really quick. He said, I predict we'll see the next big crypto cult of personality emerge in the next year. Life is cyclical. And I think you're kind of bringing that up right now, Bologi. Like, what's, what's going to happen next? Like, who's who's the next person? Dennis, I mean, you've been working on the political front for so long. You've, you've seen how these politicians are dealing with these cults of personality at this point. Um, Mike, I feel like you've just been dealing so much with the Binance stuff and, like, the cult of personality around CZ. Do you guys think it's going to happen again next cycle? Or is this like the mature moment in the space where we have seven counts of guilty uh, and that kind of puts the the nail on the coffin for these sort of personalities out there? No, you have to zoom out. The We've had traditional finance. We've had the SEC, right, for 120 years. And every cycle, there are new Ponzi schemes. Every single cycle, there are new Ponzi schemes. There are new hedge funds that blow up, right? We, we just had a couple of them. Uh, very recently, including ones where, like, literally investment banks lost billions of dollars because, you know, Bill Wang was essentially lying to them about the different uh, cross-party deals he'd done and all these sort of off-balance sheet type of things that were not disclosed. So this idea that, like, crypto is different is the problem. The problem is, is that people think because we printed these magical crypto beans that all of a sudden that we can do magical things that, that don't exist in reality. And so we, we enable people like SPF, like Mashinsky, like Suzu, uh, you go down the list, right? Everybody's sort of enabling them, the lenders, the equity investors, the retail investors. And so, you, of course, it's going to happen again. It'll happen every single cycle, just like it happens in TradFi. Um, there may not be anybody who looks exactly like SPF, like people will be more skeptical of the shaggy-haired, you know, MIT with Stanford parents guy who pretends to be an altruist because we'll know that that's definitely fraudulent (laughs) Uh, right because we've seen that one before but there'll be a different version that we've never seen before that does the same shit because every bull market people lose their mind so i just think it's kind of silly to think that like human nature will change um we can put in place better regulations we can educate the consumer so they stop investing in platforms like ftx and binance and celsius and blockfi and vault and Go down the list, there, there are literally dozens that we don't even talk about anymore because we've already forgotten them. Um, Voyager, et cetera, right? So that'll happen again. The question is, you know, will it be a different group of people that are hurt or will it be the same people? And, you know, shame on the people who don't learn from this, who don't recognize that if a company does the exact same thing as another company did that went bankrupt, that it's highly likely that you're going to get the exact same outcome. And that's what I've been warning about with Binance. I didn't say Binance was going to crash tomorrow. But I gave a list of dozens of fact pattern uh, items that were very similar between FTX and Binance, which have now essentially been proven. And there are still people who are posting fours uh, as a response, as a reply to a tweet. It's not adult behavior. And those are the people who are going to get clobbered the next time one of these large platforms goes down. So the lesson, the lesson is that human nature does not change. Crypto does not change human nature. And of course, it'll happen again. And it's delusional to think otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I wanted to jump in there. Um, you know, Mike, you, you said a few things that I wanted to say, but I just wanted to add something to that specifically around the human component. Like, um, you know, the, the reason why 
none of this is ever going to change is because humans will always be the same, as Mike mentioned. Uh, you can't trust human beings. Uh, we've, we've shown this to be true at scale. You can't trust them. There will eventually be someone that will come along that will find their way uh, into defrauding people out of their hard earned money. And so um, that's but that's also I think one of the things that's so incredibly important about Bitcoin is that it, it eliminates trust. It eliminates the need for trust, um, particularly around uh, let's let's just take the hard supply cap for existence. Like you don't have to trust that someone is going to change the supply of, of available Bitcoin. The, the same cannot be said about obviously any other form of current money that we have today, uh, particularly like fiat currencies. Um, but you, you don't have to trust that someone's not going to come along and just print billions of dollars of Bitcoin. Um, there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. Um, and that is in, in an interesting way, in a very interesting way, that is a form of a policy or a regulation, right? Like someone came along, Satoshi came along and etched into digital law that there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. And I, I think there's something that to be said about the importance of regulations, the importance of guidelines and rules. There are a lot of really important rules in Bitcoin. And it's something that we need to remember when we're looking at Bitcoin and we're trying to figure out like what we're going to do with this thing in the real world is that we need to figure out how we can create regulations and policies in the real world, not just in the digital world, but that'll protect us as consumers, um, that'll protect the industry. Because, and most of my very staunch Bitcoin, hardcore Bitcoin friends, you know, sort of hate this, uh, this line, but uh, this line of thinking, but if you don't get involved in the process of regulations and the process of policy making around what will come eventually, because it will come, you know, you you might not like policy, you might not like regulation, uh, you might not like politics, um, but politics is coming. The 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 sort of the regulators are coming, and if you want to see a world where the United States is a leader on this technology and where people don't get their sort of hard earned savings just evaporated overnight, then we really need to be involved in the process of policymaking and regulations. Um, and it's sort of in alignment with, with what Satoshi even, you know, the whole premise of Bitcoin is we need really, really strong regulations where people can understand and depend on where Bitcoin will be in the future. So I'm going to jump in there and totally echo what Dennis is saying and love the work you've put in. We got Martin here and I kind of want to ask you what's next for SBF I mean, you jumped up on stage a minute ago yeah, if you're yeah, willing to share thanks for joining us yeah yeah I've been here before uh the uh the same same sort of the same uh spot that Sam is in but but actually he's got it quite a bit worse um because he's looking at really one of the biggest uh frauds now that he's convicted um of in American history and um you know, that's 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 a big problem because there's a lot of precedent that has been set on what kind of magnitude of sentence has to kind of come with that. Um, so there, there's probably three worst days in prison and Sam, Sam is in sort of this MDC prison uh, that I've been in. It's it's pretty, pretty rough in there, by the way. Uh, the first day should be on your list. It, for my first day wasn't one of the worst days. But for him, probably the first his first day of prison was was pretty rude a pretty rude awakening. Um, I didn't get to live and grow up in the privileged life that Sam did, uh, but um, so it wasn't that bad. Uh, but the first day is kind of a, sh a shock. The second worst day in prison is uh, the day you're found guilty if you're if you've been remanded, uh, which Sam was. And so this is going to be a very long night for Sam. I, I I don't think you get much sleep on a night like tonight, and then probably the very worst day in prison is the day you get sentenced so he's got about three to six months before he gets sentenced and it, it'll be a, a really rough day a cathartic day for some um but a, a tough day for others he's going to have um a victim impact session for his sentencing so victims will be able to sort of produce in writing or face to face confronting him uh, and these can get very emotional and testy. In fact, someone might raise their voice or try to charge him or swing at him or something like that. It's been known to happen. And uh, the judge gets to listen to all of that. And of course, Sam's going to present his letters and reasons. People from his family and others will try to come together and write the judge asking for mercy. But the most important thing of all is how do his lawyers and him handle, uh, you know, explaining to the judge what the what the f happened and and why did it happen and why they could find potentially some or any mercy for him on sentencing you know he is looking at a life sentence 
And if you're Sam and his lawyers right now, you have to meet and I'm sure they'll be meeting tomorrow. Um, I have a person on the inside of MDC who tells me when, when they do meet. Um, and uh, Sam's going to be meeting with them, trying to orchestrate really the second part of this, because the first part is a fait accompli. I mean, you, nobody gets acquitted in these things. The second part is, you know, what parts of the testimony can they use and what parts from his life can they use to try to get him out of a life sentence, maybe into a more of a 30, 20, 30 year territory, which would be a win for Sam at this point, um, and not get a sort of a 40, 50 to life. You know, life has been handed out very easily by judges. This judge does not like Sam. Ross Ulbricht built a website and got life. He got two life sentences plus 30 years. Uh, a lot of people think that was undeserved. Uh, Sam, uh, you know, according to the the fact pattern here, uh, you know, I, I personally don't believe in every inch of it, but the fact pattern that, that was discovered and, and convicted on was that he orchestrated one of the biggest frauds of all time. So Bernie Madoff got life. Uh, Tom Petters got life. Alan Sanford got life. Um, many others uh, in financial fr fraud got life. So just because it's a financial fraud, a white collar crime does not mean that you can't get life. In fact, I saw somebody that did a like a $7 million fraud or something like that and got 17 years. So it really depends on the fact pattern. I think Sam's going to have to rely on a neuropsychologist to sort of try to explain his mind state to the judge that that he might be a little different from the rest of us. I think that might help a little bit, but it's it's a rough day for Sam for sure. Hey, hey, Martin, can I ask you a question real quick? This is Ash Bennington from, from Real Vision. So one of the most fascinating things to me about this story, I just wrote a book about Sam Bankman-Fried and the collapse of FTX uh, called Crypto Crack Up. And the scene that I opened the book with, because it's so striking and, and so bizarre, you, you mentioned this idea of Sam not really being like the rest of us. I think for those of us who have met Sam, who've interviewed Sam, there's definitely that sense that he isn't quite like the rest of us. And and I think that's something that he's legitimately not faking. I think he is a little bit different than the rest of us. And one of the things that's so interesting is before Sam was in MDC here in Brooklyn, he was in a Bahamian prison. And we documented the conditions in the Bahamian prison. There have been State Department reports written about it. Um, it was infested with maggots and rats and cockroaches. They were literally no indoor plumbing. They were moving human excrement out in buckets from this prison. I mean, it was a horrific, horrific place. And one of the interesting things that came out was that after that happened, Sam was asked what the worst part of it was. And Sam's response was not having access to the internet, which struck me and I think a lot of people as bizarre. We opened the book with it because it was just such a weird comment. And I'm wondering, Martin, as, as somebody who's who's been in that position before, what do you think of that response? Does that just strike you as something that just seems, considering the conditions where he was, as just completely bizarre to say? Did we lose him? I think we lost. I think he we lost. Uh, jumped off. He's coming back up. We lost Martin, but I just wanted to to echo. I mean, Martin basically just confirmed what I said earlier, which is that the biggest challenge here in the sentencing is trying to get it reduced from a life sentence because the max sentencing guidelines are, are as I calculate them around 110 years, which is effectively a death sentence. And so the question is, can he drag it back towards like where Elizabeth Holmes got to nine years? A lot of people thought that was too short, but she's obviously a woman and she has a child and all this stuff. I, I wonder if anyone will take pity on this sort of like slightly pudgy, depressed drug using, you know, MIT graduate. Like, I just, I wonder, because there's, it seems like the sentencing guidelines are there for a reason, but but ultimately it's quite arbitrary and the judge can sort of decide to do whatever they want. So I'm curious to see yeah. how that ends up. It is arbitrary. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. It, yeah, you're great. Thanks. It, it is rather arbitrary, which is, is fascinating. And, and the, the judge that sentenced uh, Ross Ulbricht, uh, Judge Forrest, was known as the meanest sentencer in the courthouse. And she was actually, the rumor is she was kind of run out of the courthouse because she was giving people above guideline sentences. Uh, judges always give below guideline sentences because the guidelines are pretty formulaic and they kind of find little bits and pieces that double count and do other things to sort of ease the burden of the guidelines. Sam's guidelines are going to be something like life. Basically, they stop counting after 
um, 30 years, they basically just go to life, skip to life. Um, the guidelines, I, I'd encourage you guys to add up your own guidelines. There's, you can just look up the PDF. It's, it's fairly easy to do. And, and Sam's like, you know, just off the charts. But if you um, try to find uh, any compassion for the guy, I think that, you know, the judge has a hard, t hard job of just sort of figuring out where and how to sort of come up with a sentence. It's not going to be easy. Um, and again, the, the pressure of the guidelines and everyone else is going to sort of like point to life as the kind of, you know, most likely sentence in my eyes. Um, in terms of the internet thing, yeah, Sam asked me the same thing. Um, you know, that was his biggest concern. And he thought that he would get internet in federal prison, uh, that it was possible. Um, unfortunately, uh, regular internet is not possible. It's, it's strictly contraband, of course. Um, I also felt that way. We're, we're very used to the internet in day-to-day -day life. Um, it's, you know, we're, we're in fact used to cell phones in our day-to-day -day life. And it can be a little liberating not to worry about, you know, something buzz buzzing in your pocket every two seconds. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know, not being able to browse the web, not being able to really even send an email very effectively. There's an email system, but it's not very good. Um, it's just a different way of life that you're going to have to get used to living. And I think the funniest thing about Sam is that, you know, he decided when he was in eighth grade that he hated books. Well, this is the last place you want to be if you hate books. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, I love books. And I read, I read about 500 books in prison. I was in prison for a little less than five years. Uh, Sam's undoubtedly going to be in prison for longer. Um, this is not a, the kind of place where, you know, a book hater would, would thrive because ultimately, you know, I think you would want to be, you know, for me, it was actually kind of a joy to be able to, to catch up on a lot of reading. Sam is not a reader. Um, I don't know what Sam is. Is he, uh, I don't, is he a doom scroller? Like, it's hard to even like understand what he could do for fun in there. Um, you know, there are things to do like lift weights, uh, play sports, um, you know, I read a lot, uh, you know, you can even play music in, in certain prisons, but yeah. you know, this is, uh, you know, going to be a really hard time for him. And as I've said in some other spaces, Sam is not going to go to a normal prison. Um, I went to a quote unquote, you know, there's a, no such thing as normal prison, first of all, <laughs> but there, there are four levels of prisons. So there's the federal, uh, prison camp, which is, uh, you're only eligible to go to a camp if you have a short sentence, if you have a nonviolent sentence and all kinds of other stars align it's not easy to get to a camp uh sam is not eligible for a camp in any way shape or form camps are so nice they basically don't have fences oftentimes they're, they're kind of very loose uh the low system is the second uh level of prison systems i i attended the low uh low prison systems have drug dealers fraud um you know they certainly have their fair share of gun crime uh, a number of sex offenders, which is basically a code word for, for pedophiles. And, and they're relatively tolerable. You know, they, there's not a lot of fighting. There's some drug use. There's fights if you want to find them, but there's not much fighting or raping or murdering. It can happen. It does happen sometimes, but it's, it, it's fairly rare. If you're looking for trouble, you, you can find it anywhere, not just in a prison. The next level is the medium. Um, and this is probably Sam is about a 50% chance, I'd say, of, of going to a medium. Uh, mediums are not fun places. This is real prison. This is for bad boys. You know, everything below I just mentioned, like camp and low is kind of a bit easier, but the medium is 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 a rough and tumble place. There's people in the medium who will kill you um, if you cross them. There are people in the medium that will abuse you if you're a weaker prisoner, which Sam would qualify as. Um, Sam is not going to have the backing of a gang or a city. You know, you can actually have the backing of a city if you represent the city effectively. Say, if, this is what I told Sam, which is that he should pretend he's from Oakland and actually learn the maps of Oakland and say, you know, I don't know what the street maps of Oakland look like, but he could, he should say something like, well, you know, I'm from, you know, from Forest Street or something like that. And, and kind of territory. <laughs> um, because those kinds of things actually matter quite a bit. Um, and you know, it's a different world. Turf matters. Your nickname matters. The way you stand and sit matters. The way you look at somebody matters. All this stuff is very important. And Sam doesn't know about any of it. You have to know all kinds of cultural things like rap music and TV shows, all stuff Sam does not care about. So it's going to be rough. The medium's a tough place. The penitentiary is the highest level of prison. Um, it is the, the worst of the worst. Uh, you can get murdered for looking at somebody the wrong way. Um, you can get raped for, for 
no reason at all. Um, you can, um, it's a really, really ugly place that, that is the place that is generally reflected in television, uh, the Shawshank Redemption uh, type films, the Oz, the, the things like that. So he is uh, likely to go to a pen. If he gets a life sentence, he definitely will be going to a pen. If he gets 30 years or something like that in that territory, which we call football numbers, there's baseball numbers, which I got, which was seven. And then there's football numbers, which is like, you know, 28, 35, 42, you know, that think of a football score um, versus a baseball score, like three, zero or seven, three or something like that. So he's definitely in football number territory, not baseball numbers. And I think, you know, with a high enough sentence, you can easily find yourself on the pen, even without a life sentence, but they tend to want to put people you know, a lot of people have this misconception that, oh, you're a white collar criminal. You're not going to spend any time with, with somebody really bad. No, it's all about how much time you get. They don't want to put somebody who has life in a place with people who have two years to go. It doesn't make any sense. The guy with life has nothing to lose. The guy with two years to go is about to go see his family. So uh, a prisoner who has life is going to be with other prisoners who have life. And in Sam's case, that's not good. Um, and again, he, he is Jewish, which I, I hate to say is, is not in his favor. Um, the, there is an enormous amount of anti-Semitism in prison that's, that I found quite, kind of intolerable. And, and, and I, I tried my best to sort of, I don't know, you know help uh, push back against some of it. But at the highest levels of prison, it's not just anti-Semitism. It's just outright brutal. Um, the whites, if you're white, you almost by, are de facto a white supremacist. And I know this happened in Ross Albrook. You have to sort of stay with the white supremacists they, in essence, there are two of them. There's there's one called the Aryan Brotherhood, and then there's another group called uh, the Dirty White Boys, of all things. Odd name, but uh, it's, it's a very tough kind of thing to do. You have to assimilate with one of those groups. And unfortunately for Sam, he's Jewish, so I don't think assimilating with the, the white supremacists is going to work very well. And I think he's just going to have a really, really hard time if he goes to a pen. He's going to have a hard time at, at a medium, but I honestly don't think and again, I, I don't wish this on anyone. I feel bad for Sam in a lot of ways. I don't think he would live very long at, at a penitentiary. I mean, it's possible Ross has been, you know, for instance, you know, been able to sort of survive the pen. But Sam is a little different from Ross. Ross is charming. He has a he has a mind, a, a good mind. Sam is a little bit, um, you know, I think he's sociopathic. Uh, he's obviously got a little bit of an autistic kind of demeanor where he can't really, you know, empathize with somebody and understand them. Uh, I could see somebody um, asking him, you know, what the fuck are you looking at? And Sam saying something like, well, I'm um, technically I'm looking at a fellow prisoner who is um, six, six foot tall, apparently. And, you know, he would just sort of get stuck in this like rain man thing. And, and that's something that somebody would, you know, kind of beat him up for. And I think that's, you know, a really hard thing to do. Whereas if you, if you know how to go with the flow, uh, of the environment you're in, you, I think you could do fine anywhere, um, including a penitentiary, possibly where, you know, even though it's the worst of the worst people, uh, if you have a little bit of street smarts, you might be able to survive. So anyway, that's my spiel. I want to ask Justin really quickly. Justin has a, an amazing story of similar going to going to prison for a little bit of time. And now he's a Bitcoin entrepreneur and educator in the space. Um, but Justin, do you have any thoughts on like what Sam's about to go through? Like, seven counts of guilty and he just got taken out of the courtroom by u.s marshals and handcuffs like what's next for this guy um shit can you all hear me yes sir oh yeah um well kind of like the guy was talking before and i think the other dude martin you know they're they're speaking about prison experience from their skin color you know they're white as a black guy um I went to the state prison and it was a bit different, but from, you know, how I see Sam on interviews and, um, you know, just from, you know, these past few years of following them and hearing other people talk about him, I think he's in for a ruder awakening than he was in the Bahamas, uh, because in the Bahamas, he probably still felt he had um, a chance of, Beating this, um, he probably still felt like he had a chance of, of coming home or, or whatever. But now knowing that he's convicted, um, 
whatever he had a taste of down there in the Bahamas is now about, about, now about to be prolonged. Um, I don't know how his mental could be. You know, uh, he does look a bit different, autistic. Um, you know, I joked around in the channel with you said, I think he'll get life plus 30. But if he does have these kind of disabilities, he'll get a long sentence, I think. Um, I know I'm not necessarily sure where yard he'll get put on. But um, he's probably he's probably in there thinking right now, like he probably thinks he really can still get out, to be honest with you. Um, I've seen those types of people come in prison before. They just still think they have a shot of getting out. They're going to still fight. Um, Do those people yeah. like make it? Do those people like mentally make it? What do you consider mentally making? I mean, I'll leave that open for interpretation, but, you know, if I was about to get a huge life sentence, I don't know. Here's what could happen to him. I mean, um, kind of like the other dude said, if he finds what they call a car to get into, I don't, I don't necessarily see him being able to get um, accepted in any of the white supremacist cars. Um, he'll probably be, if he is, you know, highly, and he's getting intimidated a lot, beat up a lot. He'll probably find a way to check off, which means he'll go to find a way to get shipped off the facility, go somewhere private. Um, he'll more than likely, he gives off the energy just from looking at that he's not going to be able to survive a yard um, just because of how weird he is. You know, Can I interrupt you real quick? Who is that? It's Screlly. I, I was, I'm a fellow uh, convict. Man, hold on, man. No, man. You you talked a whole lot. Hold on, man. Hold on. But do, do uh, your thing. Do your thing. <laughs> I just think um, I I don't know what it's gonna be like for him though, man. Like he he got a lot of decisions to make. I know he gets uh he gets sentenced sometime in March, so he might still have a little hope. If he gets anything less than you know twenty years, he'll probably consider it a win. But anything higher than that. He could flip out, but go ahead, man. What are you about to say? Well, I was going to say, you know, in the federal system, there, there is no private uh, jail anymore. And so he would be sh getting shipped, as you said. I think he would get checked in uh, from yard to yard to yard, which is very tough. He's got to yeah. find a place well, where they'll let him live. And I'm sure there might be a, a place where they'll let him live or they'll they'll sort of extort him to stay there. <laughs> um, the, the, down, the other interesting thing for Sam that somebody mentioned – is that he does have what what he terms severe ADHD. Now, state prison's a little different from from the BOP, but at least I would imagine it's probably the same, same in this regard. They don't give a shit what what diseases you have, what mental ailments you have. ADHD doesn't exist in in prison. Autism doesn't exist in prison. That idea that you know, unless you absolutely desperately need a medicine to survive. They're just going to disregard that. So the reason I mentioned that is that he could possibly go to a, a a health facility. There's a medical. There are a couple of medical facilities like Butner and others for prisoners who have cancer or they've got severe circumstances that require large amounts of medication. That they're called level two or level three care centers or something like that. But there there are prisons for those types of people. That's all I wanted to add. No, you're right because uh, Butner. I was at a youth spread uh, called Pope. It was in Butner. That's when Madoff was up there in Butner. I mean, you know, you got folks like Madoff. Um, hopefully, he might want to try to get shipped to Arizona to be, um, you know, bunk mates with, um, what's that guy's name, Ross Albert. It's real strange watching somebody go from Bitcoin to prison. Um, but we'll see. We'll, 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 it's just something you got to play ear by ear on. Like, once he gets his for sure sentencing, um, I think we could come back up here and, and speculate more on what's going on through his mind. But right about now, it's even more, it's even more of a, a place of like, it's probably even worse not knowing what you're going to get sentenced. You know what I mean? Cause when you don't know what you're going to get sentenced, it's just walking, you just walking around in like total darkness. Again, if he gets, if he gets anything with some numbers, he'll probably get blessed. If he gets letters, a lot of times people want numbers instead of letters because it's easier to get your sentence knocked down if you have numbers on it instead of letters. But you just have to keep playing the ear by ear and you know hope the best for him. If and if you lost money with him, 
I don't think they're going to hold the best for him. Well, apparently you can go talk to him if you lost money, Martin said. So, you know, I guess there's going to be a huge ass line. I added Jesse to stage, and uh, but first Jason's had his hand up for a bit, so I want to give him a second. All right. Hey, Jason. Hey, what's up? No, I appreciate it. I had a question for Mike Alfred. Um, Mike, uh, it, I was wondering, did Ash, uh, Ash Bennington write a book about SBF, and what's the title of that? Hey, I'll, I'll jump in there. It's uh, called Crypto Crack Up, um, and it's, uh, it's on Amazon now. Oh, thanks for that. Jesse, feel free to jump in there. <clears throat> yeah, I, I wanted to speak. Y'all, you know, y'all were debating how y'all thought he was going to do well or you know do in prison. Um, I, I you like the other guys that spoke before me. I, I did some time, and to be honest, uh, a couple points. Um, he'll he'll probably be fine. Really, he, he, I mean, his parents have money and stuff, so uh, he's going to have money on the books. And and the other inmates, they're going to look at that. So you know, he'll probably you know not he's not going to join a gang or nothing, but you know, he'll definitely be paying you know a certain you know, gang or, or whatever to uh, definitely, you know, watch his back. And, and what you, people don't understand about that is like uh, yeah, they, they, they will they will lose, you know, 10, 10 low, low, low level uh, gangsters or, or, you know what I mean, that are in their gang protecting him. They're willing, you know what I mean? Because these guys are, this guy's probably going to be feeding some of the higher ups in the gangs, you know, dropping them off, you know, $100 a week or whatever. But another thing you said I thought was interesting is like, um, like his mental and like him thinking he's going to get out. Let me tell you something. Him thinking he's going to get out is what will get him through it. The people that don't get through it is the ones that lose hope and just have no, like no mental, like, like they do, they have no hope of getting out. You know what I'm saying? Like his hardest part right now is, is like, um, I agree with Justin is being in the dark about his sentence. I, I, I got convicted. And so I had to go to a sentencing and it was put off for like two months. And that was like the worst time of my life ever being locked up. And I, I've done a lot, of, not a lot of time, but I, I got some years in. So um, these next, you know, these months till March is probably going to be his hardest time. I don't see him. I don't see him getting. I don't really believe he's going to get life. Um, I mean, there's a guy I was just telling some friends about this. You know, he, he was a head of a regional bank around here. He stole 18 million dollars and he, he got he got convicted by the feds. Went to trial, got convicted, and he did six months house arrest because he's highly connected. Um, don't forget that his family is highly connected, and he did pay off a lot of fucking heavily connected uh, people, including the president. So, you know, it's possible to see him get a five, ten year sentence or something. I'm not saying that's the case, but it is possible. Hey, guys, is there, um, before I give some commentary, just had a couple of questions based upon your experience. Is there? Is there like a, a Bitcoin economy for people like Sam in prison where, you know, do, do people obviously know that they could try and get a private key or, or uh, just <laughs> any of the dynamics of, of like sure. of ownership of assets and being able yeah. to transact? <clears throat> There's 100% an like economy you. for that in prison. I'll tell you why. There's a lo lot of scams uh, that go on in prison. Uh, these guys, they have cell phones, they sneak cell phones in, they do all kinds of scams, and a lot of their money, they move through uh, Cash App and Bitcoin. 100% no, know this for a fact. I'm going to share something else with you. Um, I have a nonprofit. We're not teaching nobody to do no scams, but I go inside prisons and educate on Bitcoin and how to use it upon release. So, um, yeah, people, people know about Bitcoin inside of prisons. They they're eager to still try to get their hands on it either way. Like, uh, like who was that Jesse? Like you just said, um, there's a total matter of fact, I hate to show this, but I have an interview on my podcast from bars to Bitcoin podcast. And I'm interviewing this guy who did like 15 years in the federal prison. And he actually helped me get inside to teach Bitcoin to people. And when I was in there, a lot of folks eyes were lighting up to even hear more about it. Um, it fits Bitcoin fits how uh, people inside prison view money anyway. We are we're used to dealing with different type of currencies, whether it's stamps, cigarettes, chips, commissary. So there's a big, big uh, market for Bitcoin inside the penitentiary. But what what about personal safety of just like someone trying to figure out whether they yeah. can get hold of his private key and all that <laughs> stuff? 
So I, I know a lot about this. So, um, you know, uh, I, I know almost every Bitcoin criminal. Um, and I, I, we had a group in our prison called Crypto Thugs. It was, uh, uh, I was the president of, of Crypto Thugs. It was uh, a very, it was a lot of fun to sort of teach and, and talk about Bitcoin with these guys. Um, I certainly, once things settle down with Sam um, and he gets to his yard and he gets squared away, I'm definitely going to be sending my people to pay him a visit. And we want that private key. I know you got it. I know you got a bunch of private keys, a bunch of wallets all over the world. We need those. We need those right now. I, I don't know if that was a joke or serious. I, I'm joking. But I think that the um, the one thing to keep in mind, I, I mean, it, that idea could come across some prisoners' minds. But um you know, the one thing I want to add that's important to understand about a federal sentence is that parole is illegal, uh, or I'm sorry, parole has been abolished in the federal system. So there is no way to get a lesser sentence in the federal system other than through the appeals process, which is, is extremely unlikely. The First Step Act signed into law by President Trump actually does allow for some wiggle room. So in the federal system, it's 85% of your time if you don't lose any good time. So 30 is, is about 25. You can get a year of halfway house. So that gets you down to 24. You can do a program called RDAP that gets you to down to 23. But that's about it. Um, the First Step Act credits have kind of been unclear about how they're being implemented. But theoretically, with the First Step Act, you could go from like a 23 to a 20 on a 30-year sentence. So Sam, if he doesn't get life, Sam will come out of this at some point, You know, most likely in his 50s. I do think, and you know, Jesse and Justin can definitely talk about this. There's this concept in prison called institutionalized. After enough years pass, and everyone thinks the number is a bit different from each other, some people say it's after three years, some people say it's five, some people say it's 10, some people say it's 20. But I certainly noticed myself that folks who have been in prison for 10, 15, 20 years, they're very, very different. And so many people say they never recover from it. Um, and again, I could give you a lot of stories about what happens, but generally institutionalized means that these people have habituated and acclimated to present to prison. And their cell or their, their cubicle is their home. And um, you have to take your shoes off before you enter their home, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It, it is a very odd thing to see. Um, and it's a sad thing to see. And um, you know, Sam, again, you know, you're taking somebody who's lived a privileged life. There are very few people in prison who have lived a privileged life. Um, you know, it's it's a very rare thing, to be frank. Uh, almost all, uh, you know, about 70 percent of prisoners in, in the federal system are minorities. Uh, of the white prisoners, at least half of them are sex offenders. It's, it's a very kind of odd place for Sam to be. There are probably there aren't many people like him. I've never heard in my life of an MIT graduate going to prison, for example. And what, what about the co-conspirators? Obviously, snitches aren't looked very favorable. Um, do you think do you think they're going to get away with or do you think what's going to what's your thought on them? And if I was still inside and, and I'm kind of a shrimpy guy, but if I saw the shot or Gary waltz into my prison, I'd beat the shit out of him right then and there just off principle GP general principle, just right, right there, because that's, you know, that's what snitches get, you know, you're turning on your best friend from college. Come on, bro. You can't do that. If you just met the guy, I still couldn't let that go, but you're not getting an ass whooping, but this man, this is your best friend for 20 years. And you go and tell on him, you take the stand, you point your finger at him, you throw tossing him life. Cause you want to not do your little time. You're, you're going to get five or 10. You can't stand up and take it like a man. You got to tell on him. So you get what one or two. I mean, I think they should still get time. I think it's disgusting, quite frankly, that the co-conspirator system there, the fastest you can sort of rat, you know, you may get, you know, an insanely uh, low amount of time. Carolyn, they all think they're going to get uh, time served or, or zero, you know, probation, which is crazy. I mean, I think they should all get a bunch of years too. They enabled Mark it. They, they could have stopped it. Martin, what do you think happens with like Caroline specifically uh, for for her case? And she, you know, turned herself in, and uh, as a female, like, what's her situation going to look like? I mean, I think she's going to serve time no matter what. Yeah, what and does it and does it mean anything that they probably knew his track 
well, his strategy was to throw her under the bus because he made that he made that clear like way way before on, on these spaces. Yeah, I mean, I think she, I think she can get three to five years. I, I think she's probably hoping for for probation, and it would be, a, I think, a travesty and a miscarriage of justice if she got no time in prison. Um, but I think that you know she wasn't probably as culpable as maybe we we see from the outside. She was a woman in love. Uh, I think Gary and Nashad are honestly more culpable. Uh, women always get treated better in the justice system. Very, very rare for women to get a ton of time. Uh, but Gary and Nashad are, are sitting here like Boy Scouts. When I heard Gary on the stand say that he's hoping not to go to prison, I just, my jaw dropped because this is the biggest, you know, there's a reason everyone's interested in this. This is the biggest fraud possibly of all time in American history. That's that's not a small thing, by the way. Uh, that's a very big claim. The biggest fraud is the U.S. dollar, bro. Well, sure. But the number two and number three co-conspirators, his partners in crime, are talking about not going to jail? Man, you sneeze wrong, you go to jail in America. Uh, you're the number two of the biggest crime ever, and you, th- you talk about, I'm not gonna, I hope I don't go to prison? Come on, man. And what about Sam? We, we didn't even see Sam Tribuke. He's just disappeared. You know, I, I've been talking to a bunch of the people involved in this case. Um, uh, you know, I think there's so many layers of culpability here from for everyone. I don't think they're done. I think there is a chance you see more indictments. Um, I think they would become in the form of guilty pleas, knowing that, look at Sam, I mean, shit, you know, uh, you don't have a chance of beating this thing. But they could conceivably go after more people. I mean, more likely than not, I think they're done. But I do think there um, are others in, involved in this case that, you know, have yet to sort of surface. Um, Sam's one of them, that Sam. Uh, but there are others. And uh, you, you know as well as I do who they are. There are a couple that are more under the radar, actually. There's there's somebody, a couple of people from Alameda that, that were very senior there who seem to have just sort of disappeared off the face of the earth as well. So, you know, they're, in Madoff, they, they had like 40, 50 people in Madoff, I think. So they could just go down the list and they'll all plead guilty uh, because there's, again, there's no beating this system. It's, it's uh, you know, a de facto guilty verdict or guilty plea, no matter what. Unless you're at Lehman Brothers, they seem to have got away with it. Well, if you get indicted federally, it's all over. State, you can win. Uh, and in fact, in Baltimore right now, you've got a 50-50 in state. Uh, in New York City, you've got a 25% chance in state. In federal system, and you've got less than one percent chance. So, if you get indicted, you're screwed. Now, the question is, what do prosecutors want to do? Prosecuting some some guy at Lehman is is wasn't at the time that exciting. Since then, there've been a number of bank prosecutions. Uh, some guys from Deutsche Bank, some guys from UBS, some guys from Goldman have all gotten indicted, and and many of them have been sentenced and are serving time. But in general, I I, I see where you're coming from. That you know, the financial collapse led to no indictments. This is a financial collapse of sorts, uh, self-inflicted in a lot of ways, but so is Lehman. And, you know, this guy's going to gonna get hung, basically. Um, so, you know, I totally understand that. But ultimately, you know, the law doesn't look at things that way. And prosecutors look at the newspaper to decide who they indict. You know, if there's a big bad guy out there, um, you know, they need to be, they're the good guys. You know, they need to prove that they're the good guys taking care of the bad guys. And People said Sam's a bad guy, and they said, well, no problem. We'll find a crime. We'll figure out what he did, and that's that. And that applies to anyone. You know, they've done it to Rob Blagojevich, who, if you read his case, it's very interesting. He barely really, I'm not even sure he did commit a crime. But it's it's this sort of specter of justice, uh, you know, that, that they're trying to carry out, I think. Yeah, well, it certainly sends a signal to anybody or any company that is trying to patch up a effed up balance sheet um, with a token by printing money in an industry that was created. Well, Bitcoin, Bitcoin was created as a result of money printing, Lehman Brothers, the largest chapter 11. Uh, and then we have the series of companies that commit similar fraud and with FTX try and buy politicians, buy regulators, buy governments um, and, and hide the whole thing just by printing funny money, marking it to market, um, and doing exactly what our industry was created to prevent. So, One thing I wanted to add, and I'll shut up after this, um, is just that, uh, uh, you know what, I mean, I'll leave it alone for now. Thanks. I've talked, talked, talked enough.
just to to bring it back a little bit to the to the crypto side and the implications for the space i mean to simon's point you know in many ways if you were following the story on cnn for example or not to pick on cnn here but any mainstream media outlet that doesn't go into the depth on crypto it's really interesting because i don't think you come away with it with the perspective that the ftt token and bitcoin are in many ways mirror image opposites right i'm curious if if anybody has any thoughts on whether or not the this trial and like the spectacle of it in media has educated people about the difference between SBS, FTX, and FTT versus the what people in the crypto space who care about decentralization, who care about permissionlessness are trying to build. I mean, I, I hate to be the skeptic, Ash, but um, I, I don't think most people are gonna learn anything. Like they're still holding BNB right now without recognizing that BNB is functionally the same thing as the Celsius token. It's the same thing as the FTT token, the Voyager token. God knows what else. Um, people are human beings are human beings. The next time the crypto market rips higher, they'll buy whatever goes up the most. I, I'm still convinced that 99% of the trading is not fundamental in, in orientation, that it's simply trend following momentum, speculation. And, and maybe that's fine. Um, maybe, maybe that doesn't mean that you can't build valuable companies or valuable protocols in the space, but I don't think this trial, because it was so theatrical, it was, it, it's, it's ready for, a, a, you know, you wrote a book and there's going to be a lot of books about it, but there's also going to be a lot of movies about it, right? There's going to be something like the social network uh, type of movie, like Ben will probably do a movie on it, um, hopefully improve on the, the terrible book that, that Michael Lewis wrote. Um, so it, it's so theatrical that, that I think people are going to look at it more as entertainment. Um, then they're going to look at it as a, as a true lesson. And so I, I don't think anything changes. And I hate to be the skeptic, but I think that's just true. But isn't it interesting? Yeah. Somebody who, I can't see anyone who wrote one of the main books that's you know selling really well that seemed to take a pro-crypto position. I mean, to me, and I think to a lot of people listening to this crypto, to this Twitter spaces right now, they have experience in crypto and they're not making that you know connection like, Sam Bankman Fried and FTX represent crypto. I mean, I think that's the way it's been portrayed in the broader media rather than SBF and FTX were the betrayal of the core principles of cryptocurrency. Yeah, Ash, I think, um, I think the bigger lesson was um, actually for the exchange operators and the companies that are going to look at this and say, holy shit, I better get my shit together. I better make sure that... Um, you know, I've got all these systems and controls because if you're one of those exchanges and we, we know these exchanges exist in our industry, we know that, you know, there's exchanges that were like, were founded like back in 2011. And if you're telling me throughout this whole last decade and a half or whatever, 15 years now, well, yeah, um, that they didn't think that that client money's just been sat there for ages and they were making VC investments you know, I don't want to single out individual people or anything like that, but um, I, I think it's more of a, you know, a, 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 an exchange operator, a business operator of here's what not to do and here's the consequences. I think the average person was more interested that um, SBF was uh, funding two of his girlfriends and, and one of them had wanted to destroy the other hedge fund. Um, as a result, and the fact that he was uh, making promises or, or making suggestions to the Bohemian Prime Minister that he's going to pay off the, the FTX is going to pay off their $11.6 billion debt. I think the sensationalism was what the average person was, but I think it's a real strong signal to anybody that's doing shenanigans with client money um, that you, you better sort that shit out now. And if you're propping up your balance sheet with a token, um, then you better figure out what to do because it's it's fraud and it's a problem. So, Simon, here's the thing, though. I, I want to point this out. Um, all right, so within 24 hours, we've had SBF convicted. Um, you know, he's guilty, and and also we had a uh, the, um, the 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 founder and some devs of the Safe Moon token um, indicted by the FBI. 
so this, you know, with exchanges, there's 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 kind of already you know rules and regulations to a certain extent as far as those go. But you know, there's you know, it's it's funny because a couple months ago I was in a space and and these people were talking about launching tokens, and I was like, listen, if you're in the United States, like I wouldn't suggest launching a token, like unless you you know you're a hundred percent gonna be on top of your game, everything logged and stuff. Uh, I wouldn't do it. And they were like, oh, there's no laws on it. Well, look, you know, just 24 hours ago, we had the Safe Moon devs indicted and they're probably going to go to prison. And so it shows you right here, like crypto, like, yeah, OK, you could say it's not regulated and stuff, but I promise you they are coming. The feds are here and they are not going to fuck around if, if you mess up. Hey, Ash, to your point, uh, just if I could try to address it directly, I, I think that basically SBF is as much a real uh, crypto founder as, as Bernie Madoff was a real hedge fund manager, right? Like if you think about like a real crypto founder, like think of Brian Armstrong, quiet, unassuming, mostly works in the shadows, highly technical, highly principled, does not uh, do a lot of self-promotion, et cetera. And of course he doesn't get publicized in the same way that SBF does. Same thing with Madoff versus like Paul Singer like a world-class 40 plus year hedge fund manager with a world-class track record is almost a ghost. You can barely find him. He comes out for one or two conferences a year, doesn't do TV, but has one of the best track records of all time. And so I think, you know, just as most people should be smart enough to know that Bernie Madoff is not a real hedge fund manager, people need to be smart enough to know that SBF is not a real crypto founder. Like it was all fake. The last real thing he did was a few million dollars of kimchi trades, you know, like five years ago. Everything after that was essentially fake. So again, he's a caricature of a real founder. They'll do movies on it. It'll be great entertainment. But again, I don't think there's much to learn because it's not real. Like, like the only lesson is like, stop believing that people who are faking everything are, are doing anything real. Like stop believing in the Bernie Madoffs of the world. Yeah, it's just a morbid uh, fantasy that, or, or something that you know everyone gets wrapped up in. The same thing happened with Jeffrey Epstein. You know, we, we all sort of get fixated on on these like very morbid situations. One thing I'd add, and I remember what I was going to say earlier, is that the person who I think is next, and I don't wish ill will on anyone because they know how bad jail can be. I think Richard Hart, um, you know, has done a lot of the same things that uh, sort of Sam Bankman has done. He's done the things that piss off prosecutors, piss off judges, which is gloating. Uh, when I first went to this guy's website, I, I didn't think it was real. It was stuff like Richard Hart owns the world's biggest diamond and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff like this. It was all fake. Um, I had a five minute exchange with him on a space and I, I found him to be maybe the most insufferable person I've ever talked to in my life. And, um, you know, I, I just, you know, it's fairly clear from the SEC complaint that the any prosecutor that picks up the case would have a lot to work with. Again, I don't, I don't wish that anybody puts him in prison, um, but I, I do think, you know, if I had to pick somebody, that would be a... I wholeheartedly agree. And Martin, you don't know this, but I'm one of his biggest adversaries over the last 18 months. I've come after Hex every which way that I could. I've tried to publicize as much as I can the problems with the protocol. I even went on the documentary. They flew out. There was like a team, yeah. like three cameramen and producers and everything. And we filmed for like three hours. But then because he was a credit, he was funding the movie, they cut my footage out. It was really damning stuff. And it was exactly what's ended up happening and i do think richard hart will end up in jail because he's effectively a criminal his entire career was criminal activity up until crypto and then he realized in crypto he could do scams at the biggest scale in human history that's the beautiful thing about crypto small time scam artists can become massive scam scammers right like if you look at the background of the crypto.com founder it's very similar his whole past career was scams people forget that because their name is on the la lakers uh, arena just like sbf put his name of his company on the Miami Heat arena, but it's all like, if you look at the background and you really go into it, it's like, wow, small time scam artist who graduated to global fraud via crypto. That's the story here. And CZ I mean, when you're, is actually not highly differentiated in his activities. He's just bigger. Than when you're running him. around with Louis Vuitton bags, um, you better hope that you're squeaky clean. Cause that is the number one sign of like, well, what would a scam artist do? Buy Lambos, buy, you know, Louis Vuittons and Sam had, that going for him that he didn't do those things he did them in different ways uh that that aren't a classical representation of of kind of a, a con artist but i i think Hart, you know one of the problems i had with him is you know I, i've been in hedge funds and markets my whole life and he he said something on this crazy call where he says um 
you know, he said he's raised like or donated 10 million bucks or something like that to charity. And I was like, and so, so when I, I said something like, Richard, do you ever talk about anything other than yourself? And he's just started going to this tirade about, about all his accomplishments. He, he goes, have you called Bitcoin every, every tick in Bitcoin for the last five years? Right. And I was like, I uh, have you. And then he said, have you donated $10 million to charity? I said, yes, actually I have. <laughs> and you know, all this stuff that, you know, is kind of like this continuous garbage. And the, my favorite part of it was he said, the cycles go in three years up and one year down, three years up, one year down. I keep telling people that it's always right. That's how crypto works. And I'm like, do you, do you think this is some kind of deterministic pattern? It's all physics that this has to happen um, just because it maybe has happened before. Does this have to continue? And, you know, the guy was just like too stupid to talk to. But the the reality is there are a lot of people that like him and believe him in, in him. And he sort of fleeced them all. He's he's now got the SEC complaint. He's basically turned off his Twitter. Whereas before he was sort of rallying uh, everyone virtually every day, now he's not so loud. And, you know, Sam had this similar phenomenon where to keep the scam going, he had to sort of be ever present, constantly instilling confidence, hence, hence the term con man, in, in his victims to keep the scam perpetuated. And it's sort of all kind of the rug was pulled at the end when the, when the Fed pulls the rug. Why wasn't there somebody else who could have pulled the plug with FTX? You know, I think that's the big question. People like yourself and Eric Wall, who have been trying to pop the hex bubble for a long time, and short sellers like like Kevin Jang, uh, Kevin Zhao, who who popped the the Luna bubble, um, you know, play an important role in the markets. And unfortunately, when you're a short seller, you also paint a target on your back um, from people with money, regulators, the, the very people you're shorting their stock of. You know, I was a short seller in Wall Street, and I I made a lot of enemies for that reason. It did not help me when it. it it was my turn in the in the barrel, so to speak. So, you know, it's it's a very tough thing to be a short. Uh, and it's very unpopular, especially when the asset prices just keep going up and up and up. Remember, Sam Bankman's first five partners, it was five of them, four of them left and said Sam was a fraud. And they what must have they felt, Tara McCauley and, and her colleagues, seeing Sam become this billionaire, seeing him on the cover of, of magazines and saying shit. It must have been really tough to talk shit about this guy for the last five years, seeing him become a skyrocket and then now, you know, being able to be a little vindicated. But it's hard to sort of call out something like Hex or anything else. It's rising and rising and rising. You feel like an idiot. You feel stupid. And then all of a sudden you get vindicated. Yeah. Yeah. One of, one one of the other more. Um, easy, though, just to be clear, there was no no psychological issues whatsoever calling because Hex was just an outright scam and it only went up for such a short period of time. That basically for the last year and a half, two years, like you can't, you couldn't be wrong calling him out because there were so many holes in that story. But go, go ahead. Sorry about I, that. I just wanted to say thank you real quick. Thank you, Will, for having me up. And uh, this was uh, November second, uh, twenty twenty three. Where were you the night that Sam Bankman Fried was convicted on all seven counts? I was right on this Twitter Spaces. So thank you so much, guys, uh, for letting me join. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ash. Yeah, one one of the more interesting things that I've seen is um, the Stockholm syndrome from people that um, follow these characters and over, um, you know, they find out that these people are not what they thought they were and how they react to it. So there are, there are many people right now that will tell you that Richard Hart did this on purpose uh, because he wants to go in front of the SEC and prove that this is not a security and therefore he was making a sacrifice uh, for the cause. Um, and he did all this to prove that Celsius and cell token was a fraud and you need to do it all decentralized. And uh, therefore, he had this grand plan and he knew all along that he was going to be 10,000 moves ahead of the SEC and the DOJ. There's people out there right now to this day that still think that Mazinski did nothing wrong, um, that the, the cell token is still to be revived. And that um, if and only if Sang Bankman Freed hadn't been such a fraud and naked shorted the cell token, um, then today Celsius would still be alive. Um, Mazinski is still going to take the stand and say that, uh, you know, this was all SBS fault. This was all FTX's fault. Um, just the sheer level of, you know, blame shifting. And then I'm sure that if... Uh, I didn't see it actually, but um, you know, I didn't get an opportunity. But they, they'll, uh, uh, others will try and pass it on to the whole Barry Silbert stuff. But just 
the whole nature of passing it on and the Stockholm syndrome. Um, that's a real thing. There, there are people that will hold on to that to the bitter end and are still going to be working to get, um, you know, uh, I don't know if SPF saw it. I didn't see any of those. It's funny you say that, Simon. Last night we held a, we held a space for the, uh, to talk about the Safe Moon devs getting arrested. And, and Safe Moon Maxi's coming there and was like, you know, it's okay. We're we're gonna we're, we're gonna push through this, and we're like, your your devs are are going to prison. Like how? how and, and that's the thing. You, I suggest anybody who's in crypto, like, you know, um, you know, did, you know, you invest, you in trade, whatever. But you, you cannot put your faith into to, to the, into these people. Um, you will get burned. I don't care if it's central exchanges. Uh, you know, de- the developers, whatever. And it's funny, you know, y'all brought up Richard Hart. You know, I got a buddy. He's he was heavily invested in Hex. He he sacrificed a lot for the Pulse stuff. And the whole time we're telling him, like, you know, this was like a year and a half ago. We're like, bro, he's fixing to go to prison. Like he's so cringe like there's no way this guy's living like this and stuff and not spending people's money and then sure enough you know it's funny because we looked stupid for a while because he just kept doing it kept doing it kept doing it and the guy's like oh it's fine and and, you know like what you said earlier um uh about feeling you know validated or whatever um you know it finally come around and we're like you know we told you you know what i'm saying but it, it everything comes full circle and and crypto sometimes it just takes a little longer it's, Martin, it's funny we, because no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, just just real quick on Richard. Like this guy's got a huge talent. You know, he's a master salesperson. And like, what's funny about it is he could have made a fortune just partnering with somebody that actually was like, you know, legitimate and had a product and stuff like that. Or even just being a stockbroker or real estate agent. This guy could have made millions of dollars and a very legitimate career. Clearly, he has a gift of gab, as do many of these guys. Charlie Munger, many consider one of the best investors of all times, said literally that you know, if, if these scam artists knew how much money they can make legitimately, they would never <laughs> engage in fraud. But I just wanted to add that as I think of Richard, like as he's this tour de force. What a charismatic like. To get to be able to get hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people to to part with their money, uh, what well, he could have done that for for a good a good startup or something. And he, like and that. he did. He did, Martin. He was the spam king. He sent more spam than any other person in the world for a period of time. He was advertising Viagra, diet pills. This he was his a, old career, right? Yeah, he yeah, was but, Richard but Schuler. That, yeah, I mean, he, Richard Schuler. He he was pretty darn prolific at spamming and scamming. Um, so again, like crypto was just a new avenue to do what, what he already did really well. Um, I just want to make one real quick point for, to Simon, because like, Simon's been through the journey with me with Celsius. I remember when Simon was still wanted to believe that because he invested in the company, he wanted to believe that Mashinsky was a good guy. What I'll tell you, Simon, is I took more hate for calling out the shenanigans at Celsius than any other thing that I've called out in the last few years, um, in, including Hex including Binance and including First Republic, although First Republic was pretty bad because all these VCs were crying that their startups weren't going to have access to their money at Silicon Valley Bank. And so they were going to report me to the SEC. They were crying like little children, uh, even though both of those banks ended up failing, which was quite obvious to anybody who knows how to read a balance sheet and understand how bonds work. But uh, another story. But like the point is, is that this is going to keep happening. There's going to be another Celsius. There's going to be another Hex. It's incumbent upon the people in this space and the people who know better and the people who know how to do real analysis to continue to speak out like I will continue to speak out. Again, a year ago, everybody told me, how dare you talk about Binance? Brother, we're trying to have a new bull market. How dare you talk about Binance? I said, well, I I have to talk about Binance because literally Binance is almost a carbon copy of FTX and Alameda. It's just people didn't know the names Two Sigma and Maripeak. They didn't know that Binance US was a funnel for, for CZ's market makers. Right? They didn't know that Binance was running an unbacked uh, stable coin. They didn't know any of those things. So, of course, they would rather prefer a bull market and for Mike to shut the fuck up and not talk about the next scam. But don't delude yourself. Binance is 100% operating in the same way as FTX and Alameda. And I'm not saying it'll go down anytime soon. But if you think that you can just post fours on the Internet and make it go away, you're going to end up exactly like FTX customers did. And that's all I got to say. Martin, yeah, Mike, there's still there's still grand conspiracies out there that me, you, Corey, Max Kaiser uh, were paid by SBF in order to take down Celsius. Still there. Martin, what do you think about the parents in this situation? And Jason, Dennis, Mike, everyone else who want to chime in on it, and anyone in the crowd who has some thoughts on it, be interested to. From a legal perspective, or from a ethical? I mean, like some of the stuff from the testimonies and the screenshots from Signal, like it was clear the dad was at the very least making some decisions or okay, has yeah. sway, so not, right? not from an emotional parental perspective but oh, i uh, mean 
yeah. they're probably yeah sad but yes from a criminal perspective what, what i what i would have done if i were a prosecutor which were, even the words coming out of my mouth disgust me but the idea typically in these cases and i think jesse knows this is they will leverage your family against you so i'm surprised that they didn't bring a case against his parents in order to secure or threaten it in order to secure a guilty plea um this happens quite a bit in in courts the the wife is usually uh somebody uh they'll even threaten your mom or, or your dad or someone like that it's very easy to threaten a spouse by the way because you know they basically are in it they, they are in it with you uh and there's a crime called misprison it's got a very weird name but basically misprison means uh it's a felony that's punishable by prison uh, which is that you were the witness of a crime and you didn't report it so virtually every spouse is guilty of that so the, the feds, if they really think you're playing games and they really want you to plead guilty, they can kind of bring that out and say, you too. Now, again, they could they can invite the parents belatedly, they, especially his father, as you mentioned. He's a 70-year-old man. They got their guy. I, I think that, you know, it depends on the attitude of the Southern District. To me, stepping on this 70-year-old man's neck and, and further crushing this sort of family is pretty devastating emotionally now on the flip side he should have been there to say sam what are you doing sam why you know what's going on how can you afford all this stuff uh he should have been there to say no sh i'm a law professor that deals in taxes like i know finance show me what's going on here explain to me how we can afford all how you can afford all this because i think it was very obvious that like between all the money he was spending of course it's obvious in hindsight he was investing hundreds of millions of dollars in all kinds of liquid stuff, which, you know, is a very odd thing to do. Uh, most startup founders, I've, I've experienced this my whole life. You're rich on paper. You don't have any money in the bank because you're waiting for your, to cash out your stock at some point years and years from now. It's very hard to get liquid. Sam, for some reason, thought everyone thought he was liquid. And, and they thought that because of Alameda. Now, again, a huge problem. If you're his father, where are you saying, like, look, you have this huge conflict of interest. What are you doing? You know, you have an exchange and then you have a hedge fund. If you have such a profitable hedge fund, forget the exchange. Who cares? Keep making billions in the hedge fund, Sam. You can't raise money from exchange because all these people are going to say, well, what about, you know, you and <laughs> trading on your exchange? It's going to be too, there's no Chinese wall big enough. You know, unless you put the companies on the other ends of the earth, you know, you're the CEO of both. Who's buying that? You know, it's, it's a very crazy thing to do. And his father, time and time again, could have told him to sort of stop and instead, he egged him on and in fact wanted millions of dollars of the same money from the company got it it got property got money says he accidentally signed the deed to a 30 million dollar home <laughs> you know it happens all the time and uh you know he easily could be indicted again i personally feel bad for the guy i don't, I don't think they should do it but it certainly could it's funny Martin. you mentioned him uh you know using using his family as leverage I think they had enough. I think they knew they had enough. <clears throat> and, and I was kind of torn between what I thought the outcome of this was going to be. And, and I'm still torn between what I think the outcome of the sentence was going to be. But it's funny. Do, 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 does anybody here remember when the uh, picture of Caroline in that coffee shop in New York surfaced uh, when she first came back in the States? Absolutely. Listen. All right. So it was funny. We were in a space when, like, that photo hit Twitter and was, like, you know, kind of went viral. And the first thing I did was we located the uh, the um, the coffee shop on Google Maps, and we realized it was like three quarters of a mile from from one of the FBI headquarters. So like out the gate, uh, we knew for a fact she was going to testify. Um, you know, Sam was who they wanted. Uh, and another thing, like Sam, you know, Sam was on these Twitter spaces talking and stuff, and and and, and that was crazy to me because. Martin, I'm sure you know, the first thing your lawyer is going to tell you, especially if you end up um, uh, uh, like testifying is, you know, you, you're not going to go out publicly and talk about this stuff. So I kind of knew he, they were going to burn him from the get go. I'm just not sure what's going to happen with the sentence. But um, it, it's, 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 it's been it's kind of crazy how, how everything unfolded and stuff with them. And I agree with you, Martin, what you said is like, why wouldn't his dad and, and people closer to him like being like, hey, you know, why, why are you doing this? Um, if you remember the video when remember the video where he handed that girl that hundred dollar bill, it was like so cringe yeah. watching that because it was like even though it was like a you know a commercial or whatever it was, it was like he didn't even want to hand that hundred dollar bill to to her to her. So um, it was just yeah, I don't know, man. I kind of 
I, I, I have different opinions on different things about Sam Bankman, and I'm kind of torn between some of them. But um, they definitely had their guy when they got him. Well, I think that isn't that the hallmark of a rich, privileged family, though? Like, is anyone really surprised that his dad wasn't like giving him proper guidance? Because, I mean, <laughs> look at the situation. They're, they're all in deep shit of their own. They're doing different things, different crimes. So I'm not surprised at all that he wasn't there for him. Yeah, that's probably true. I was just going to add that, you know, I think they would have let use that leverage against, uh, I think his name's Joe, is it? Uh, Sam's dad, uh, to avoid uh, a sentence, uh, a trial. No prosecutor wants to go to trial. It's, it's the last thing they want to do. It costs $10 million to go to trial. And it takes months and months of preparation and tons of paperwork. It's a lot easier to say, hey, just sign this and we'll sentence you and we'll probably give you, cut you a little break and all this and all that. And, you know, Tiffany, who spent a lot of time with Sam uh, personally, um, said that, you know, he, he wasn't sure he'd plead guilty even with no jail time. And obviously, I think he could have gotten, you know, a, a 20, you know, a solid 20 that, that you know, doing 12 on 20 or 15 on 20, it's doable. You'll come out and you'll still be relatively young. Now he's in a much weaker position and it's going to be tough. Hey, Jesse, hey, guys, do you know to, uh, um... uh, oh, sorry, Simon, I just, uh, do you mind if I just ask Jesse a question real quick? Go for it. Apologize. Uh, Jesse, I'm, I'm very interested in, you, you seem to be on the fence on whether Sam is going to get a big sentence. And, and the reason I'm asking this is I, I actually felt the same way. I thought that he had such an incestuous kind of relationship and the father and Gary Gensler and all the rest of the nonsense and the president. And I was like, man, this, this is going to get weird. Um, Anyway, I'm interested to get your thoughts because I, I, I think I'm epically wrong and I think he's going to go to prison for a long time and I'm going to owe the person I bet a coffee because of that. But I, I actually was thinking that Sam was too fragile and had too many connections to, uh, to do anything more than Martha Stewart did. So, Jason, I have, I have I, from the get go, I kind of had two theories me and my friends, we've talked about this a lot in spaces and stuff because it, you know, it has affected the crypto market, uh, you know, a, a pretty big bit. Um, one theory is like you think, like you know, he, he, or you said he's he's highly connected. He's paid off a lot of people. Um, you know, he 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 could get a slap on the wrist, or or he could get some time and then get pardoned later. That is a possibility. Do not forget that. The second one is is they let this shit happen. And they let him do this, and they are going to burn his ass to to set a tone with this type of stuff in the crypto industry with these exchanges. Yeah. And then then they'll work their way around and get these other ones too. That because the, the, they are, I, I believe there are other ones on their radar and stuff. With some, some of the stuff going on, uh, you know, central exchanges are heavily uh, they are guilty of market manipulation and all kind of you know insider trading and stuff like that. And um and I'm not, I'm not saying it's all the same of what what Sam Bankman had going on, but I, I believe that they let this happen and, and they let him pretty much be a fall guy to set a tone in the industry. I think, hey guys, is there, um, is there um, more to come? Because I know there was like these um, uh, political financing. One, one of the stories that came out was that they got a billion dollars stuck in a, in, in a bank account in China, I believe, and then um, paid a hundred a hundred million dollar bribe to a an official to like is there is this campaign financing and all that stuff like still to come and then we've also got uh, i think the the political corruption as well whether those are going to be clawed back um and we still got that to come it wouldn't surprise me if those politicians get to keep it he, he does have another trial coming which i'm guessing he'll you know if he's smart he's just going to plead guilty to um, but I think that the, the one thing I want to say is he had a lot of connections. Um, you know, when, well, he pulled them with client money. That's why. But he had the, the operative word is it's, it's a past tense. The day I got indicted but, but Martin, was his parents still have them, though. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but they I don't think still so. has those connections. No, no, absolutely not. The day, the day I got I got indicted, it, I was, it was the loneliest day of my life. <laughs> you realize that everyone around you doesn't want to be anywhere near you. And they want to forget that they knew you, forget that they ever met you, even friends of yours. Uh, I've been able to, you know, repair some of that. But for someone like Sam, it's, you know, everyone's going to say, Sam who? 
you know, um, he doesn't have a friend in the fucking world that he can rely on right now. He is the most radioactive person. You know, a lot of these people he's given money to, they are probably going to get to keep it, but in a way that, you know, has worked out for them, not uh, because they're going to ever think of the name Sam Bankman-Fried again or think they owe him something. You know, absolutely not. You know, this guy's, you know, road roadkill. You know, what do I owe him? He, I didn't know he was a fraud. He was a fraud. I have nothing to do. I want nothing to do with him. Why would you as a congressperson or something like that? Furthermore, Congress people can't tell Kaplan what to do. Kaplan doesn't give a shit if you're the if you're a congressperson. Some of these judges are presiding right now over the prosecution of President Trump, you know, and they're they're playing it as fair as they can. So a lot of these judges, you know, they're people, but most of them, you know, are are impartial for a reason. And no congressperson is gonna, you know, tap on his shoulder and say, hey, you know, Sam Bankman, I really like this guy. Like, what? Get the fuck out of here. I'm judging him, not you. Uh, you're lowly, even if the president called. I don't think it would do much. Hey, Martin, it, it's funny. I, I'm sure you noticed it, you know, too, with, you know, your uh, your past is is you, you could literally have two different people or 10 different people uh, with the same kind of like criminal history and the same crime with the same impact on the same level. And and all 10 get 10 completely different sentences. It's, it's wild how our justice system, justice system is ran and like how sentences are handed out. And sometimes it's about who, you know, sometimes it's not, man. It's just, I, I, I you know, I, I've been almost certain I'm going to, I'm going to see people go down and get burned before, you know, heavy sentences and, and, and they come out, you know, relatively, uh, with a, uh, you know, relatively as good as you could get. And then I've seen other people go down for something. I'm like, Oh, that, you know, they'll be out in a year or two and, 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 and they catch 25, 30 years. So it, you know, at this point, it's, federal- we really won't know until March. There's only there's only two variables. The first is who's your judge? What's their history? Kaplan's a mean son of a bitch. He doesn't like this kid. He's gonna fry him. The only other uh, variable that matters is is what was your conduct? Uh, it it may be you know your attorney, but ultimately who you know doesn't matter for shit in the federal system. In the state system, you got a nice attorney that knows your little local judge really well. It can help. In the federal system, that shit doesn't matter. You know, the, the Martha Stewart had all the resources in the world, went to jail. Michael Milken, all the resources in the world, went to jail. Charles Kushner, all the resources in the world, went to jail. Me, it doesn't matter. They, the bigger you are, the bigger the fish you are, the harder they want to get you. And the more fair the judge has to be. The judge says, oh, shit, I, I really got to give this guy time because if I don't, it'll look bad for me. And these judges have careers, too. They want to go up to the Second Circuit. They want to go up to the Supreme Court. They don't want to be seen as somebody that's a pushover or somebody that's going to be influenced. You know, and these judges are appointed for life. There's nothing. If Joe Biden called Kaplan tonight and said, I want you to give this kid a life sentence, the judge can say, you can't do shit to me, Mr. President. You're out of here next year. I'm here for life. Go fuck yourself, sir, and hang up. You know, because there's nothing that Biden can do for this guy. He could say, well, I can try to get you on, on Supreme Court. But, you know, something like that, it would be – not worth it for, for President Biden. You know, to, for what? You gave him $5 million? Biden raised a billion dollars. $5 million is nothing. He never even met the guy. So there's no, you know, uh, quid pro quo here uh, of any kind, I don't think. Michael Milken was, a, was mostly a legitimate businessman. He was a billionaire. He made even more billions. It took him 40 years to get a, to get a pardon, or, you know, of his, of his uh, crime that he did in 1980. You know, and he was like, he did all the charity work. He did all the rehabilitation of his image, and he still didn't get a pardon until President Trump, you know, gave him one, most likely again for some donations and, and gifts. But you know, Sam, Sam's kind of cooked here, I think. I, I actually agree. Um, when I gave my two scenarios, the one I came to later, as I more thought about it, was I, I think they, I think Sam was, you know, supposed to fail in a sense, and, and they are going to burn him. But it's funny you talk about Trump. Uh, we were talking. We were talking about the other day how Trump gave Kodak Black a, a pardon. <laughs> so, you know, uh, there's no telling yeah. who gets those pardons, man. Ben, I see you've been, you've been lurking up here for a bit, but you kept putting your hand up. I'll let you get a second here. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just feel like there's a lot to say, and I don't have a whole lot of experience in the field to really have great input. But a question I do have for you guys, Martin and Jesse, is how 
how black and white is it having money and connections versus not having money and connections in when you're in that jail environment like it seems like obviously you could make a case is good because you have that the, that power you talked about how the family ties could have connections to those the gangs and whatnot but is there a flip side to that where it puts a bigger target on you in that situation it makes life even harder i let jesse talk but I think he's got the worst of both worlds because he's, he says he swears up and down. He doesn't have any money and his parents just spent a boatload of money. Their, their last money, they're just professors. They weren't super millionaires or anything. So I think his parents are, are now down, you know, their, their last money. So he's, he's, everyone's going to think he's loaded. And I think, I'm not sure he is. And he, you know, I think that's kind of a bit of a problem, but Jesse knows what it's, what it's all about. I mean, and you got money in prison, it's not a I would say it's it's a good thing and a bad thing yeah it, it definitely is but talking about like the privilege privilege from your family it's funny you asked that um my granddad my grandfather was a circuit court judge uh where, where, I, where I live and where I was actually convicted and sent to prison from and it's funny the judge that sent me to prison was actually a prosecutor in front of my in front of my granddaddy for years um and even to add more to it my granddaddy was murdered in in a courtroom so he was heavily respected. My, my family had a lot of money. Uh, my my grandmother, to the day she died, had probably more more pull in this in this community than than any man that lived here. But um, just because who her, who her husband was, but yeah, I, I got away with a lot of stuff because of that for a long time. But when you when you cross a thir- certain threshold, um, and, and, and sometimes it's your first crime, sometimes it's your your tenth crime. And obviously for me, it was multiple crimes in because I, I never, you know, did anything like, like Sam Bankman did or whatever, but, um, they will burn you. And, and like, when they got tired of me, you know, they sent me down the road for, for a good chunk. And, um, and, and, but, and I, I think Sam is past that. Um, and, and you guys have made some good points about his family and stuff. Um, and, and like, you know, like the, the, the money would buy it and stuff, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually the, like, just from this discussion, I'm, I'm really thinking they're going to burn him uh, more than I did before this discussion. I, I was kind of thinking that already, but uh, I, I think he's played out. Um, I, I, I really don't see him. I think best case scenario, he, he makes it out of prison. Um, I'm not sure if he gets a life sentence, but, you know, if he gets 20, 30 years, you know, 40 years or something, you know, he, he, he'll make it out, I think. And, and Martin, you brought up a, a point there, too, which is – does anybody actually know how much money and power and wealth he has right now? Because, I mean, the clawbacks are still on the table. And certainly, you know, he's had a lot of his wealth connected to, like, the reputational side. Now that that's blown up, sure seems like things are sinking. Like, is there a chance that maybe that power that we think he has just from all of this recognition globally is really just going to turn into pixie dust and float away? And that's not even going to help him. Yeah, I mean, there's... The only place he ha- he he has to be powerful right now is prison. So you know, there's not much power he can exert other than inside prison. And and I think that money does talk a bit in prison. Um, and it doesn't take very much money to to have people on your side in prison and to live a relatively good sort of the best prison experience you can get. Which you know, maybe a couple thousand a month would will get you all the stuff that you can get in prison, basically. Uh, and I think he, he may be able to pull that off as well as being a celebrity. You know, there are going to be guys in there that really want to meet him. They're going to bend his ear. They're going to want to talk to him. The problem with Sam is I don't think he's a nice person. I don't think he's going to want to talk to a guy who wants to stuck a, start a trucking company when he gets out or something like that and say, Sam, can you tell me about how I could go about doing that? And you'd have to humor that for 20 minutes. Sam's not the kind of guy who's going to do that. He might say something stupid and get, you know, get slapped or something. One, one of the interesting dynamics is when the Chapter 11 bankruptcy case um, intercepts because uh, he took a bunch of client money and um, some of those investments, I mean, the vast majority of them were shit, which created the hole. Um, but some of them have really uh, started to fill that hole. And the way that Chapter 11 works in crypto is that the, they, they were, you know, SBF and FTX went into bankruptcy at the bottom of the market. So everybody's claim, you may have a Bitcoin, but everything will be dollarized based upon the price at the time they file bankruptcy. 
Now, one of the real scammy parts that really doesn't work with um, Chapter 11 is that if you had a if you had a, a Bitcoin and you've locked it in at like fifteen thousand or nineteen thousand dollars, and now we're up to thirty five thousand uh, dollars, the higher those prices are crypto, the closer you get to being made whole in dollar terms. Um, now, what the Chapter 11 can do is if it gets, at the moment, it's up to about 90% with some of the private equity. But if it gets close to 100%, they could just sell all the crypto. One of the big positions is Solana, um, which has been pumping like crazy recently. Um, and if they sell that crypto and can make everyone 100% whole, then all the other assets remain either with the shareholders or whoever's next in line. Now, the IRS has got a massive, I think they did a $47 billion claim or something, something stupid. Um, so they've been next in line in order to receive all those assets. So the higher the price of crypto, um, the worse it could get for creditors at a certain point, which is just a really unfortunate dynamic. This happened in the Mt. Gox case where there was only 10% of the Bitcoin left. But Bitcoin has been ripping for 14 years since uh, or 10 years, whatever it is since. And so they got like a 10x recovery, but uh, 10x less Bitcoin than when when they actually started. Now, with SBS wealth, in theory, there should be a litigation trust set up and all of the fraudulent transfers that happened should be transferred over to that litigation trust for the benefit of creditors. So in theory, the creditors, if they get out before it gets to 100%, and there's probably another year of this chapter 11, um, so the price will probably take them out. But they then have a fraudulent claim against SBF. And in theory, unless he siphoned off his wealth to um, trust or has no wealth left, then creditors should be able to benefit from anything that is left. Just uh, wanted to jump in real quick and uh, say, Will, thanks for having me up here. Not a whole lot more to add. Uh, too, too many people here with great things to say. So um, thank you for putting the room together. Um, glad this is glad this chapter is behind us. Um, couldn't bear myself to watch the trial because I just ready to be over it. So uh, it's good to see you all. And hopefully we'll see you all in um, in Texas as well for the summit that's coming up, the Texas Blockchain Council Summit. And then we'll be having a dinner there. So looking forward to seeing some of you there. Will, looking forward to seeing you there at the dinner. Yeah, thanks for joining, Dennis. If anyone wants to jump up on stage, probably keep us open for another 20 minutes or so. Uh, definitely have some experts in the room on what SPF is expecting next with Martin and Jesse, at the very least, uh, being pretty vocal about their experiences. Uh, and then a few other people on stage. So we've gone through a lot so far. I mean, the seven guilty counts, obviously, is like the headline here. And then there's so much more to unpack from... Uh, what's going to happen to the parents who obviously were pretty intimately involved as we saw with the signal chats and the emails and like the demanding for pay raises uh, between different people and that, uh, that family all the way to like, what's going to happen to all the co-conspirators who pled guilty. Uh, so a lot going on there. Uh, so yeah. If Quick question. Else, do we know, do we know where, how they obtained the signal shots? Is that from the co-conspirators just providing their chats or is there something is there something, is there another way for obtaining all those? Or well, we don't, we don't ever find out. Yeah, some of that's pretty interesting because there was a lot of auto delete functions that SBF demanded his team put in place. And so if anyone's not familiar with Signal, it's supposed to be like end to end encrypted. So you're not able to have a third party look at it. Uh, but there is like an auto delete feature in there as well. So if someone gets a hold of your phone, is able to look through your messages, they're supposed to be deleted after a certain time period. Not all these messages were deleted, though, and we also saw that some of the messages were from earlier when that policy wasn't in place. And I think that was a key piece of evidence, uh, or at least circumstantial evidence, not a lawyer, so I don't know how they would classify it. But SBF did instruct his inner circle to put on auto delete during like the tough last few days of Alameda and FTX, and the prosecution definitely used that as a cudgel. So yeah, Signal definitely like played a played a huge role in this whole saga, which you know that makes sense given it's a fairly secure application. But do you know if it? But do you know if it's because um, he gave up his phone or they got the pho the messages from someone else? Did we did we ever find that out? Yeah, I wouldn't know off the top of my head from that. That's a pretty uh, in depth question, but 
I would assume they captured most of the evidence when, you know, they took him in in the Bahamas. Um, and then all these people like pled guilty and they probably just turned over all this evidence as well. Right. So I assume that's how they mostly got it. Hey guys, was it, um, so him actually taking the stand, would he have done better if he just pled guilty and not took the stand? Yeah, like, definitely. Yeah, I, I agree, hundred percent. I don't know. I, what are I think the, what honestly, are the details I think he was going to get life regardless what happened. He stole too much money. It, the The dollar figure itself is the most important thing. He stole too much money. I think he's going to get life, and there's nothing pleading guilty or anything he did from the point he took the money could ever do to save him. I I think he fucked up that bad. Sometimes uh, one of the things that criminal defense attorneys recommend is going to trial knowing you're going to lose to try to explain to the judge what happened because sometimes a trial is the only way you can do that. Otherwise, you write something called a sentencing memorandum. And I think Sam's sentencing memorandum will be due sometime in like February or something. It's usually due like a month or two before uh, sentencing. And they can be hundreds of pages. And I hope these will be made public, which I think they will. Uh, and the government has a sentencing memorandum too. And oftentimes you get a lot of juicy things in the sentencing memo. Uh, and certainly from Sam's perspective, it's going to include stuff about his childhood and all kinds of things that are going to try to get the judge to see it his way. So going to trial is a way to show the judge, look, you know, it, obviously you get a chance at innocence, but mostly it's to show the judge it's not so obvious what happened here. I did have a margin loan. I didn't intend for all this to happen. I wasn't spending the money like a drunken sailor, like Richard Hart. I was trying to do the right thing. And, you know, I did commit the crime, but at the end of the day, I'm a little less culpable than maybe you think, uh, or you would have thought if I just pled guilty and, and wrote a sentencing memo to try to explain myself. So, like, I think there was that benefit of going through the trial. And I honestly think that he did a decent job of trying to defend himself and explain that, look, Alameda had a lot of money deposits and a lot of credit and a lot of, you know, just assets in general. And why couldn't it borrow money from FTX? Again, I, I personally think you should not be doing business with a related party. You know, you're borrowing money from your left hand to put it to your right hand. It's a little weird. Uh, there should be some group in the middle that is independent. But, you know, technically Alameda was a customer like anybody else and had borrowed money. And when it was came time to pay the money back, it couldn't. This has happened in finance a million times. I mean, this, this happens all the time in finance. I'd be curious from you guys. You were both very quick to answer that when he said was was Sam opening his mouth a bad idea. And I've always kind of wondered that because you hear this in the movies and whatnot of like you have the right right to remain silent and you don't want to talk basically. Why is that? Like, what are the exact things that he said that made things worse for him, and how is it made worse for him? Just by explaining what happened from his point of view. Okay. Everything that you say, they will repeat verbatim and debate the factuality of what you've just stated uh, and tell the, uh, the jury why you're lying and why the, the, this was fraud because you lied about these specific things over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And over. Every statement you make will be used against you. They're yeah, just going to use use it over and over again. So talking at all, you fucked up. So in yeah. other words, like saying something, even if it's truthful, it doesn't help you. But any little thing could be used the opposite. So it could only hurt uh, you, essentially, is what you're okay, saying. Okay, Ben, for example. He was consistently being questioned. Uh, and, you, and you have to somewhat respond to the question. And, yeah, they're going to verbatim take your entire response and break it down word for word and explain why you were lying when you said this. So, so Ben, uh, for example, uh, you could say something that is truthful, right? And you might word it a certain way. And then, and, you know, they ask you, you know, all these questions again or whatever. And they ask you, they'll ask you, and it's like, they'll ask you the same question, like 42 different ways. And if for some reason you answer one of those a little bit different, or, you know, it means a little bit something else, then, then you're, you're, you're considered a liar then. You know what I mean? And they, they pick you apart. 
uh, a prosecutor can make a misstatement. And he's just he just makes a misstatement. He's like, oh, uh, you know, my bad. I meant to say this. Or, but if you do it and you're on the stand, um, you are. I, I mean, it's, it's just not. It's not. It doesn't go down well for you. I, I, I've never took the stand in any of my cases or anything like that. I've never really had to. But um, it's. I've seen it happen, and and that you just get picked apart, man. It's it's not. It's not a smart decision. So it's so kind just, of like when you you went out with all your friends and you all get in trouble, you have to all make sure that your story is completely straight when you come to your parents, except in this situation, it's all you, but just different days when you're in a distressed state. So you could be thinking differently on different days and make a mistake, essentially. Yeah, I don't, I don't think uh, I have a different opinion on, on this from the group. Now, every attorney who says the same thing, no, you know, never, ever take the stand. And, and I, I pushed my attorneys and said, okay, well, why is that? You know, um, and Sam, Sam's not an idiot. I mean, for him to be able to sort of explain what happened is, is not a bad idea. Uh, I think his demeanor probably didn't come across great on the stand. So that's one reason if your client just is kind of a jerk, you know, you don't want to put him on the stand. Um, the main reason, the best explanation I ever got from an attorney was there is nothing that you can say as the defendant that the attorney cannot say on your behalf much more carefully. And that, that seemed to make a lot of sense to me where I said, okay, well, that that, that, that makes sense. But there are cases many times where, where a defendant should take the stand. Puff Daddy was a famous case where once Puff Daddy took the stand and everyone heard about the amazing life he had lived, that jury was, you know, ready to throw out the case and throw a parade for him. So, you know, it really depends. And again, very charismatic guy. Uh, so Sam kind of doesn't come off as charismatic. He kind of comes off as a little slimy and weird and not like very likable. So unless you're Zantani, but ultimately I think like, you know, they just kind of doesn't help himself. Although if I'm Kaplan, I honestly, my opinion of Sam went up after listening to his testimony, because at the end of the day, the guy just kind of was like too fixated on the mechanics of a margin loan. And he lost the forest for the trees, which is that all the money's gone, but the mechanics, and this happens a lot with people, and forgive me for saying this, who have autism, where they get kind of like fixated on this thing and they say, well, it's absolutely right that I'm allowed to borrow money from FTX because I have a margin loan, this is my collateral, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, all right, dude, we get that. That's true. But if you borrow all the money from the exchange and you put it in a liquid shit, you know, it's going to be a problem for everyone. And he's just sort of too you know, fixated to not see that forest for the trees to say, oh my God, you know, you're right. That would be a dumb move. So he's like too smart for his own good in a lot of ways. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think I, back in the day, Char Charlie Schrem did it, but he was coming up to say, yeah, I'm pleading guilty. I didn't realize yeah. it was a it was a bad thing, but it is a bad thing. I know that and it worked really Charlie well. Charlie is a, a friend and he we had the same attorney. And Charlie got an amazingly great sentence. He didn't commit much of a crime either, but he uh, he got about a year and a day or 18 months, which is, you know, about as little as you can get. He also got the best judge in the courthouse, uh, Judge Rakoff. Uh, if, if Sam got Judge Rakoff, Sam, Sam would be looking at 5 to 10, maybe 15 right now. Um, it's, it's really that different. Rakoff is is never met a criminal he he has he doesn't like. <laughs> so he just gives the smallest amount of time he can to virtually everyone. He's like this, I mean, to me, he's awesome. But uh, to a lot of people, he's just this very liberal judge that's just very nice. I see Default is here. Uh, you know, we, we have some shared experience <laughs> on What's this up? topic. I was going to ask, because I'm just like catching up on all this. What's his like uh, sentencing guidelines? What's his, his criminal points right now? like 45 oh 50. my god so that's that's the number of points for anybody that knows the game those points translate to years and it's not a good translation it's that like was the translation I, score. that was a translation i spoke of earlier he's gonna get life there's no way he gets anything under than life he he stole too much money and it he didn't get me i i had Coinbase and KuCoin and all kind of other stuff, but he didn't get me. I've done Fed time. I know how these people work. He's gonna get life, and there's nothing that pleading guilty or anything else. They didn't even offer him a plea agreement because they knew, and he knew. It's I, over. I, I, I'm not sure. I agree with that. I agree with everything you said except the last part. 
uh, I don't think he wanted to tango with the government. Uh, he was just so stubborn that he didn't even want to enter into this plea agreement discussion because once you do that, it could leak. It could get to the papers. Oh, Sam's in plea negotiations or something like that. I was very strict with my lawyers to say, do not respond to any email or anything they say to you. We are not pleading. We're not going to respond to them. Prepare for trial. That's it. And so like Sam probably had a similar demeanor, especially based on what I know personally about what, what happened. So I, I think it wasn't so much that they didn't offer it. It's much, so much more that like he wasn't even willing to countenance the idea. In terms of the guidelines, I, I think I understand where you're coming from. You know, the the book, it's this blue sentencing book. It literally in default, and I probably have read it. You know, I actually just uh, put count. it up probably. top for a lot of people probably don't know if this is correct up to date. And he doesn't have any priors. I think a minimum of like 292 months. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, guidelines are advisory, but yeah, there, there you go. You found the chart. So the chart, you know, actually, he, he is literally off the chart on points, in my opinion. So he's, it ends at 43, but I think he's got around 50 points right now, which is, you know, like literally, there's no amount of time that yeah, no. equals the amount of crime. 43 is at the, at the, like, the, he's like you said, he's off the charts, and I don't really see how he could get that reduced. His, I think the maximum on uh, restitution is like a billion and he's on multiples of that. So unless he could return under a billion, get his like restitution under a billion, would he start getting any like downward departures or anything like that? And I just don't see anything like that. No, not, not, not for financial crime. Uh, the only thing he can do is he can get a double counting. So like there's a, there's a thing called sophisticated means, which I think you might, you may know of as well. Uh, it, you get a two-point enhancement if you committed your crime via sophisticated means. And it's kind of silly because every crime requires sophisticated means. And the you know it's kind of a bullshit thing. And so most judges throw out those two points. Okay, so maybe you're down now to 48. Uh, but if the crime had more than X number of victims or elderly victims, you jack up more points. And like a lot of these points are kind of like, you know, you committed the crime. Why am I layering on so many points? Uh, if you endanger a financial institution with fraud, which he kind of did, you know, you add another four points. So if you take out all those points, he could get into the like, you know, 40s, you know, high 30s, low 40s range on this chart. Uh, and it's a really interesting chart. You know, the way these points are added up is fascinating. And for fraud, you get seven off the bat. So you get seven points no matter what. And if you guys have the sentencing table pulled up, you could just go to defaults, um, Twitter, Twitter, uh, you know, uh, feed right now, or you can go into the uh, the top part of the panel here. And you get, as Sean was saying, you get points based on the amount of money that was lost. So it literally goes up every million dollars until a certain amount. I think, I think a billion like, is think, like the max. So like him, it is the max. Off, yes. all of them are way off the charts. And you get 26 or 28, I think, is the most you can get. So it's 7 plus 28, so you're at 35 off the rip, which is 200-some-odd months. Uh, but then you get all these other things. You know, if you if you had a ton of victims, you got four more. So now you're 39, so that's 300 months. And every other little thing that gets added to it, he's basically – he's in life territory, no it, doubt about it. Like as long saying. as he doesn't get life, he could still uh, he could do RDAP. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mentioned RDAP earlier. The First Step Act. There's a number. Come of off that things. Adderall, finally. <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely knock your sentence down a little bit here and there, but ultimately, I do think. Remember, the judge has got all the power here. If the judge wants to say ten years and slams his gavel, it's ten years. There's nothing anybody can do about it. You know, there's no. Uh, our, I think the minimums. He, there are no minimums on any of the crimes. There's only minimums on drug and gun crimes, which, by the way, disproportionately affect minorities. But, you know, on financial crime, there's no mandatory minimum. But so he doesn't have to do a day in jail if Judge Kaplan doesn't. Yeah, think exactly. so. of course, it usually works against you. But like in my case, it worked for my benefit because I was maxed out at 60 months and the judge wanted to give me more. So for once in history, like the sentencing guidelines, like acted in my favor. Yeah, there's very rarely a mandatory maximum, right? So like he's got no mandatory minimum. Uh, there is a mandatory maximum for a lot of the financial crime. It's 20 years. 
Um, so it's like 20 times seven. Uh, there are a couple conspiracies that are five. So it's it's sort of like 115, as has as been said. But like, I, I think the judge is going to not, he's going to look at the guidelines, but like a lot of the guidelines just go out the door. And the judge is sort of like, looks at his past history and said, who else if I had to send sentence to life? And says, are they as bad as Sam? Is he worse? And thinks it through. I think what's going to really kill Sam on sentencing that I think like Sean is right, he's, he is going to get life is the victim impact letters. There are going to be thousands of letters delivered to that courthouse that say, I lost all my life savings. Don't give this guy a shred of mercy. If the guidelines say life, give him life. And I think he's going to get a ton of letters like that and that I ruined my life. My loved one killed themselves because of this man. Put him in prison. If five, ten people have that story, it's going to be hard for the judge to show him any leads. I also think that, like, <laughs> do I get to send in a letter for seeing about 5,000 tweets about this stupid guy in the last year? Because that's really been very hard for me. I've enjoyed all if the you memes. Want, just look, the, look the address up. <laughs> I, I even enjoyed. I like, even enjoyed the BitBoy videos going to the Bahamas, like he's on the hunt for him. <laughs> oh, that's a whole nother story. He's gonna get life too one day. Just wait. <laughs> so, quick reset, guys. Since we're in a, a little space here, a bunch of new people have joined, and I'm also an idiot at this stuff, so I could use a refresher as well. Could. Could you give your best timeline for what you believe the next steps are? Because I know, Martin, you had a few ideas for, like, what month different things were going to happen in the story. So could you lay that out for us real quick? Sure. I mean, I don't I don't know for sure, but there'll be a, a, a schedule set. Uh, I don't know if Your Honor set one uh, at the very end today. Probably not. Uh, but in two weeks, there'll probably be a status conference, and they'll set a schedule. And the schedule will be uh, things like uh, – the date of the the pre-sentence uh there's there's the probation department does like this uh pre-sentence report psr uh, default has had one i've had one they're they're supposed to be independent they're not uh they're done by the government for the government uh and they end up basically taking an inventory of your crime and recommending a sentence it, it it's a pretty rough process but that'll happen probably around january yeah, it's like a little rough uh, after for that the judge to just really crush you <laughs> Yeah, it's it's such a bullshit process, the PSR. And uh, even though they're supposed to be independent, my PSR agent sat on the government's table <laughs> for for uh, for one of the status conferences. I'm looking over there like, wait a second, <laughs> what's going on over here? Uh, they're supposed to be impartial and, 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 and down the middle. Uh, so anyway, after that's done, I'm guessing around January or February, the sentencing memo comes out. That's going to be really important. Uh, we're we're going to all probably read that. It's like a book uh, that he has to write about what the fuck happened and why he's so sorry. And the lawyers are going to write it, but it's going to be 100 pages. And it's going to be interesting as hell. And there's going to be parts of it that are probably going to be redacted with black tape uh, because they're going to relate to his personal, really personal things. Uh, but all kinds of shit comes out in these uh, PSRs that, you know, I'm sorry, these sentencing memos that – certain health records, certain little details about his life that we didn't know. It's all right in front of there for the judge because you've got your life's on the line. I mean, if there's anything you could come up with that's a mitigating circumstance, anything, any story that, that shows that, you know, you're just a little less culpable than maybe, you know, you should be, it's all going to be in there. And of course, the government's going to do the same. So you're going to have two roughly 100 page documents that wrap up this case that basically lay out why he should get a ton of time and why he shouldn't get a ton of time uh, from each side. And then there's the sentencing day. And sentencing day is a hell of a day. Uh, we, a couple of us have been there. It's, it's really nuts. Uh, the big debate there is will Sam say anything on sentencing He day? should make a statement. I mean, now, it'd be kind of wild to not take the opportunity. Devastating. Now, <laughs> the funny thing about sentencing day is more almost every time, and I'm curious what you think, Default, almost every time – the judge has already written an entire opinion and has the number and everything. So there's nothing on that day that can change anything. It's all pomp and circumstance. Yeah, I mean, so, so Sam could go on there and say, 
fuck you, your honor. You're wrong. Everyone in this courtroom's wrong. I'm glad you lost all the money. Go to hell. And at the end of the day, it's not. I mean, maybe at that point, the judge says, hold on. I I will change. (laughs) As a matter of fact, I am going to change my my sentence. So nobody would be crazy enough to do that. And in the odd case that he might have some leniency, you wouldn't want to jeopardize it. But the point is that it doesn't really matter what you say or do on that date because it's all sort of set in stone by the judge anyway. Now, having said that, I bet you there are a couple judges out there that kind of maybe would give a little, like, I think I'm going to do 30, but let's hear how this goes. And maybe I'll do 35, maybe I'll do 25. There are judges that do that. But I think, you know, it's uh, it's likely that, especially for a case like this, my uh, <laughs> my judge had all of it written down and my lawyer whispered to me and said martin that's the opinion right on the desk it's stapled right there it's 80 pages they haven't filed it yet and i said what since it was all this that we're gonna say like it's all for nothing he's like yeah it's just nothing we can do it's about this you know it's they they need to write it ahead of time and you know it's all set in stone already so i think that's probably what's going to happen but if sam says something he better be sorry i think he has this opportunity to kind of address the world uh you know, the, the government's going to sort of talk as well uh, and explain why he should be getting, you know, life plus or whatever. And, you know, he's going to be able to say, his lawyer's going to be able to say that, you know, he should really be looking at 10 or 15. The victims are the, the toughest part of this. You know, the victims and the letters that come from both sides are going to be brutal. Uh, you know, it's it's going to be a rough, rough day when when all those victims get to throw I, stone uh, stand. Martin, what do you think? Stuff. I'm pretty sure that this is going to be one of those precedent cases like it was for DPR where they want to set a precedent going forward and just like crush somebody. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think he gets life. I think it's like 60-40. He gets life or sort of 30-ish uh, if there's mercy. And yeah, I, I mean, I would not be surprised. Kaplan does not like this fucking guy at all. He, he really was snarky. The whole trial, he was sort of biting at his lawyers, biting at Sam, kind of like prodding him, like basically telling him to shut up and, you know, you're wasting everyone's time. And uh, that's not good for a sentence. But ultimately, we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, Judge Kaplan has to think about this on so many levels. There's deterrence. So, you know, sentencing is supposed to deter somebody who might be listening right now from starting a huge billion dollar exchange and, and fucking it up. This is the deterrence to not do that. Um, then there's retribution, you know. So there's supposed to be some, I don't know, solace for the victims that this guy's going to pay for what he did, which kind of makes sense, right? Uh, and then you know, there's a few other uh, ends of justice that that are supposed to be met. One is safety, that that by locking him up, you safeguard the community. I always thought that one was one of the craziest. Uh, now maybe for default, that one was true, but no, I'm kidding, but, but uh, for, for everyone else, <laughs> it, it, you know, Sam's not a danger to anybody. Right. So, so I think that's a danger to our portfolio. Ridiculous. He's absolutely a danger if he's out and may be able to make another coin because people will buy it. Yeah. He's maybe, a threat. Maybe. Yeah. So that's, I guess they're safeguarding him from starting a, a token or an exchange or a, cause he, he was going to start another exchange. Um, so that, you know, safeguarding the public. And I think there's one more, I forgot the, the four. I mean, the rehabilitation is theoretically supposed to be one of them. So if he's not showing any, that's right. not showing any remorse, even if it's like fake, then the judge is going to be like, well, you don't regret shit that you did. So you're going to have some time, a lot of time to like, maybe start regretting it and rehabilitate quote unquote. Yeah. I never so- understood that one the the rehabilitation as one of the elements of what goes into a sentence i think it's supposed to be the positive one where it's like we want to like allow you to move on from this and be a positive contributor to society so so it's supposed to like push it lower and in this case that's it's going to be tough so it's only basically saying you know we're not going to give you life because we do believe you'll rehabilitate we do believe you'll be able to be a productive member of society but it's weighed against those other three. I think that's how it goes, but I could be wrong on that. So this is a slight pivot, but you mentioned it a couple of times there how the deterrence is part of this. So you're talking about how they want to deter future fraudsters, but how significant do you think that this uh, 
outcome will be for like Binance, for example, we talked about how it's pretty much a carbon copy of the FTX scheme. Like how significant will it be for that? And what are your predictions for oh. how that will affect Binance? Well, not not everyone believes that, by the way. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who who don't like Binance and who think it's a house of cards. And there are people that don't think that. And, you know, it for now, you know, it's it, the exchange seems to be operating. <laughs> you know, could it be a house of cards? Sure. Maybe. I, I don't know. Uh, and I think until until they halt withdrawals or something, you know, uh, it plays on. Um, so I think that in terms of deterrence, what it really is going to do is not so much for like a specific, you know, a person that's out there, but it basically says, look, you're going to remember Sam Bankman. And if you get into business, if Zentani and I start a business and, um, you know, we're selling, uh, you know, mouse mats. There we go. And uh, we we start he this did. business. And all, he did mats, and all of a sudden I say, Zantani, I, I think we can um, pull the wool over somebody's eyes, or maybe I do it without her permission. She's going to say, No, I'm not going to do this. Why? Because no. I remember. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, Yeah, we'll do it. We'll just say, I'm sorry on Twitter afterwards. That, that, that could work. Or well, you'll you'll say, I'm sorry. I'm going to say. W H A T H A. Uh, no, but all in all seriousness, I think that that this is a general deterrent for everyone to look at this and say, if you have a partner that's committing fraud or you thinking about doing it yourself, it's just going to end up being worse for you if, if you look at the Sam Bankman thing. So I think it especially is going to encourage like those number two, number three, number four players, the, the Garys and Carolines, if you're determined to commit fraud and you're a sociopath like Sam, nothing's going to deter you. You know, it's just something that is just going to happen regardless. But I do think it, it helps those people, the vice presidents, the whistleblowers, the, the number twos and number threes to say, wait a second, I don't want to end up like Sam. I don't want to end up like Carolyn. I'm resigning or I'm going to call the feds or whatever it is. Again, um, that's kind of the deterrence that I think it's going to play a role for. I think in terms of CZ and stuff like that, obviously a lot of people think the guy's next. He's going to go to jail. He's going to get arrested. Uh, I'm a contrarian. I I think Binance has all the money. I think you know, and I could be, I don't know this as well. There are people that have been studying this like crazy. I have not. It's just a gut feeling. They would have collapsed already. I think if if uh, it would have happened again. I'm not. Don't take my word for it. I don't know much about it, but that's just my my hunch. Uh, but you know, for CZ, he he um one of the problems is he's not an american so if he steps foot in america they can just kind of grab him of course there's extradition but you know you have to know where the guy is to sort of uh be able to pin him down and arrest him uh and he could go into hiding and stuff like that generally that doesn't work by the way um if there's a warrant for your arrest they're, they're gonna get you one way or another but you know it does add a layer of complication um it is a big exchange so usually they do not think about or care about like, well, who, you know, who, who it is or what, what matters. But if you think about something like the CEO of JP Morgan or the CEO of Wells Fargo, if they committed a crime, it would not be good for the banking system if that were to happen. Now, crypto is not the banking system, but there's a lot of money in Binance around the world. And, you know, arresting CZ is basically saying Binance is bankrupt. There's a run on the bank. Uh, it's going to be really messy. It's a lot of money. Uh, they better be careful doing that. And I think they're maybe slow rolling this for that reason. They kind of telegraphing it and basically saying, look, get your money out of here at some point. This, you know, the SEC lawsuits, they're piling up. The intrigue is piling up, the rumors. So it's like, get your money out of there because at some point it may get, you know, shut down. And I think that's kind of like a wink and a nod maybe from the feds. Again, different prosecutors are different. Some of them don't give a shit about that. Some, some of them like that. They're like, oh, this is going to cause even more mayhem. Great, let's arrest them tonight. You know that that's kind of a again a, a bit of a sociopathic prosecutor. But I do think that you know it's a very complicated thing, Binance. We, nobody knows what's going to happen there. And uh, if they wanted to arrest them, they can. I'm sure they could contrive a crime to to get them thrown in jail. But I also think that you know there's a reason there's some prosecutorial discretion. They really don't want to just arrest people for nothing. You know, it's got to be a real crime that's serious um but you know i wouldn't be surprised if they do it because now you have sam you know a lot of crypto people have gone to jail why not one more 
I'm yeah, going to keep my Binance popcorn in the so microwave far. on lukewarm just in case. Yeah, the Binance case so far is very different. It's all civil at the moment. So the the SEC CFTC. Now, what, what was different between them is you normally get a civil case. So in Celsius, it started civil and then turned into criminal about a year after the the, the shutting down of the of the exchange. Um, but the major difference there is there's a few things. So they're obviously doing a similar thing to what they would be doing to Coinbase, which is just claiming that you're selling unregistered securities without being able to sell them. Um, but then it's the international element. So Binance US is meant to be a siloed entity. Um, but they found evidence that the Tether um, or some of the, the stable coins, um, all of the client money from international and US was put into, you know, non-segregated wallets. Um, and so therefore they found that when they tried to meet some of the Tether demand uh, that came from the international side. The bit that's uh, a bit concerning with the Binance side is that in the civil case, they were covering a lot of criminal type of allegations without actually launching a criminal case yet, mainly around money laundering, um, proceeds of crime. I think they got messages where back in 2018, 2019, CZ was um, allowing for, you know, some what they very small money, actually. It was like, I think I can't remember exactly because it was a while ago I read it, but like $600 or something really stupid that they connected to allowing a terrorist organization. I think it might even been Hamas, if memory serves me right, um, to, to go through the exchange. Um, so there is no criminal case at the moment, um, but whether the speculation is that they're looking to launch one. And even then, you've still got case studies. So for example, um, what was the name of the futures exchange, Arthur Hayes? Um, Sorry, it's late here. I can't remember Bitmex, the name of the exchange. We were just talking about running everybody's stops. Bitmex, Bitmex. Yeah, yeah. Run the yes. Yes. So Bitmex, so, yeah that, but Bitmex had a similar thing. They were doing no KYC, allowing people to do futures trading with no KYC and then claiming that no US investors were using it. Um, so, you know, doing no KYC is really, really serious. That's a criminal case um, in terms of money laundering if, if that is allowed to go through. Um, but in the end, you know, he, he managed to uh, put in a, a, a bunch more adults to, you know, retire, step down, um, and then put in a, a really robust anti-money laundering program, agree not to take on any U.S. investors. Um, but the difference with Binance is they've also got all the international regulators um, that have, you know, that, that seem to be cooperating in trying to make this exchange smaller and smaller and smaller and do a you know death by a thousand cuts um, because I think they also have concerns around the systemic risk of what would happen if you suddenly if everyone withdraw withdrew from Binance. I had a quick question going back to Martin. It feels like the jury jury came back really really quickly and was like yeah seven counts you're guilty. Like it took a few hours. Is that pretty typical or does it? I don't know. I like actually, my my I basis thought, for this is sitcoms, and it's like going to be like a week, and they're like going back and forth. Yeah, I I think the jury length is directly proportional to how guilty they thought you are, and I actually think this um took uh, a little longer than I would expect it. I actually think I would have thought that they did a straw poll immediately, and just rounded up twelve guilties and said, you know what, we don't have any more work to do. Usually, uh, the judge gives a instruction that says. We can't change your verdict. It doesn't matter if you spend one minute in there or one year in there. You know, you're you're the you're in charge now, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, maybe they already decided it and they waited a little bit to look good. It did they did come back like kind of right after dinner. So it was kind of like, you know, you know, kind of was timely in that sense. Uh, I gotta tell you, uh, in my case, you know, the, it went to the jury on a Monday, uh, it came back on Friday. That was the longest week of my life <laughs> um, and it was exciting as well because if you make it through one day it means that they're really thinking about something and talking about something and for sam the clock was getting close to the end of the day and it just ran out of time on them if they would have made it to monday i'd say that 
he's now got a fighting chance. Uh, somebody's arguing. Maybe he's not guilty on one count, two counts. Who, who knows? All of them. Maybe he got to one of the jurors. Maybe he, one of the jurors is crazy. You know, who knows? But for Sam, you know, the time ran out uh, after a couple of hours. Uh, I think they could have done it faster. I think they could have done it slower. Uh, but generally here, I, it sounds like they basically said, you know, there's nothing much to work on here. I mean, it is what it is. It, it'll be interesting to see if the Times or someone like that gets some time with one of the jurors. Uh, usually that does happen. Sometimes the lawyers go interview the jurors and say, well, what'd you think? What, what convinced you? What didn't convince you? What was their best argument? What was our best argument? You know, they'll kind of go back and forth. The jurors are now free to talk to anyone and everyone and tell their story, including what happened in the jury room. They could say exactly what happened. And they could say, yeah, we, could, we thought I was guilty in five minutes. We just don't want to look bad. We wanted to look like, you know, we did our homework. But they did ask for post-it notes, which I thought was hilarious. Um, you know, so they asked for a copy of the indictment, which seems like it probably should be included in every jury room. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, they asked for written testimony of, of two of the... Uh, two of the witnesses, the hedge fund and, and VC. So, you know, they did a little work in there for sure, but you know, I, I thought it was right on time to be honest. Well, uh, if you watch the case, uh, during the prosecution, they had, uh, I think it was us attorney, Danielle Sassoon. She completely destroyed Sam during like that cross examination. Uh, basically everyone was laughing in the overflow room. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't even, it, it, it went so bad for him. How did they choose the jury in such a substantial case? I don't know how that process goes. I can't imagine it would be fully random, would it? I mean, they have to keep picking people yeah, till they I mean, find people without a bias. So that could take quite a while. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah they, so they start they, with a lot of people and then they ask a lot of questions and they, and, and they get to pick uh the, you know what i mean it, it goes it's, it's a lengthy process process or it can be lengthy and drawn out they they a bunch of people are in a room and then they strike out people uh and i i forget the term but they try to they try to jury stack on both sides uh which is technically legal as far as i understand it but in this case they like try to stack the jury against sam to be like i think like a bunch of very progressive kind of teacher type people. Uh, they didn't want like any crypto or tech bros. It's not hard to win one of these cases. I mean, they, there's almost never been an acquittal in federal court. You know, it's just unheard of. So like, you know, it, it's all performance art to me. Um, you know, I think uh, Sam um, on the cross-examination stuff. Well, you know, it, it's, it's not easy to, you know, to uh to sit there and get grilled because one of the problems is there's a second prosecutor and his name is judge kaplan you know it, when the judge decides that he didn't like you and every time you say something and you're trying to explain yourself and he says you know just answer the question and you're just like man i gotta give me some room to explain what the fuck happened and it's like that's the worst nah, villain, not, martin yeah yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of sad because the judge is tag teaming off the top rope. Uh, it's supposed to be a fair fight, and it's it's your it's one on two, and this guy's got his life in his hands. Let him say a couple more sentences about what the hell happened. Let him put some riz on and see if he can get a juror to kind of vibe with him. And you know, the prosecution, uh, you know, was was able to sort of dismantle him, uh, which is typical. But I think it's partially, you know, one of the reasons is the judge sort of was was on their team. I'll be interested to see what uh, the BOP determines where he should go. Uh, I agree with that default, but I got a question for you and Martin. Uh, we know SPF is a little autistic and, and he's, uh, he's kind of good with numbers sometimes. He might make a mistake here and there. How do y'all see him playing out um, as far as being successful at the P-knuckle table or the spades table? Y'all see? think he's got a chance? Oh, I think that's where he's going to shine. I love P-Knuckle, um, bro. <laughs> if he – Spades is, is the game in there. Uh, but if he can get a cell phone in, oh man, I think he's going to kind of – if he's going to be lit. You know, the problem is he needs to get to a lower medium. Um, you know, pens, I 
I don't know. You know the default? They're, like, they're, I mean, they're sale. everywhere, but they're exceedingly harder to get the higher you go up. I mean, if you have enough money and enough influence to get one, yeah, of course. But uh, I would suggest him not going to any table in gambling because he has such a mouth on him, and that would end very badly for him. He's he's definitely going to get slapped up. Yeah, and if he gets uh, on a cell phone, I'd expect some crazy shit coins to start flying around, maybe some Solana start flying around. Do y'all, does anybody want to put a wager on how long it takes him to get a neck tattoo? I'm trying <laughs> to – I want to see if they'll sell me the domain of FTX and if I can get his Twitter account so that I can start tweeting from his Twitter account. I mean, I think it be looks like FTX 3.0 is coming back. Accounts are getting redeemed for up to $0.60 cents per dollar now, which is a lot higher. Than well, there's – there's a lot of collateral. I, I think it'll go to a hundred cents, but it's uh the question is like what happens to that domain name? I need that. Yes. Hey, so I heard do you, do you want do you want Zintani how long he paid for it? Get me on the account. Z, do you Get want me Zintani, on there. Zintani at FTX.com? Wouldn't that be the greatest fucking email? I accept. I'm ready. Go ahead, Witters. Oh, thank you. I, I joined late, and I have um, – so apologies if this has already been covered, but um, has sentencing uh, went through? Or, like, what's over under that he gets, you know, less than, what, like five years in, like, a Martha Stewart prison? No, that's that's not happening. That's not reality. He's going to a penitentiary. So, medium or a pen, but probably a pen. Also, Martin, by the way, there's 44 days left on the DNS until it expires. So that's honestly ironic and good timing. Well, that's interesting. Um, I had to set a bot up on yeah, there to like lot. snipe the uh, DNS when it when it expires. Yeah, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you about that offline. There's definitely some uh, stuff I, I'm I'm uh, interested in. One of the things I'm interested in is is what's going on at FTX uh, in the bankruptcy court, are those assets going to move? I think they are. Um, in fact, I think we might hear something by the end of the year about um, FTX having a new home. Uh, and then again, what's the equity worth? It's probably worth zero. What are the deposits worth? Is there debt? What is, what is the debt worth? What are the creditors you know, positions worth? It's still really very much in play. And as, as you know, many people have made fortunes in distressed debt uh, you could have bought those deposits for ten cents. I bid five cents for them uh, last year. Um, ten cents sounded like too much to me. Ten, twelve cents. Had I known what I know now, that Anthropic is worth you know twenty billion dollars, and Solana would would sur- not just survive, but but actually go up a little. You know, I think I think eighty to ninety cents is actually priced in for recovery because it's sixty cents present value. The bankruptcy court's not going to be distributing that money for a while, so. By, by having a market at 60 cents, there's this assumption that, you know, 70, 80, 90 cents is eventually going to come out this thing. And I think that's about right. Markets are usually pretty smart. And, you know, unless something crazy changes, uh, they have to get rid of that anthropic stake, though. That's the big, big chunk. That's $3 billion that if I'm them I'm trying to get rid of that yesterday. I think the Solana holdings is, is definitely actually worth more now. I think it was like 37, 35 when they went down. Can they get it liquid though? Um, what percent of the Solana is it? Is uh, it enough I to look, hurt it? I think they said so. It was like quote unquote. I think it's stakes. seven to ten percent. Yeah, it's it's a significant amount. Yeah, it's like ten percent with like three different year lock in. So that's insane. You got some liquid now, and then you got another in a year, another in two years, another in three years. But as soon as well, you move it, it's going to spook the market. It says twenty one billion market cap. So I think technically maybe the Anthropic stakes worth a lot. But either way. You know, it's a bunch of money between Solana, Anthropic, and a bunch of the other stuff. I, nobody knows what that Modulo uh, investment is worth. The K5 investment. There's a bunch of stuff here. Uh, there's cash. You know, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff. So it'll be interesting to see what that recovery is. And I actually think maybe who knows if the equity will be in play. But I do think you know the other question is where are all the assets going to go. The 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 software. I want to buy. I wanted to do this for Theranos. I want to just offer the bankruptcy court 50 grand. Give me 
all the computers, all the databases, all the emails, all the domains. I want to sit there and just read all SBF's emails with a bucket of popcorn for the next six months. I mean, the ironic part was like they had that hacker, quote unquote, come in and just like decimate a lot of the a lot of the logs and install malware on the login portal. So I don't know what they have left. I don't think it's much. Uh, you know, there's a whole story behind you, that. You telling me that email server is not gold? Yeah, it might be you gold if you can if there's anything left on it, which I don't think there is because there'd been a lot. It's more. a mail server. Come on. I don't know that how like intense like. The, the shredding of if it was sent to dev null if they just like deleted it or like i don't know i would think that sam was pretty uh pretty evasive when it came to that i think the That's discovery the shows that they have all his emails so i think you can get it um yeah the process will be you'd have to actually participate in the auction so that they're, they're looking at there's about three bidders in the auction um, they want to launch Celsius, um, not Celsius, they want to launch FTX 2.0 and issue everyone, equ all creditors equity in the company or sell it in the auction. So they'll, they'll take off all the assets. The equity is completely out of the money. Um, cause for now, the credit, well, creditors come in first, but then the IRS put in a $47 billion claim and all the state oh, yeah. regulators and government. And they they'll put up whatever. Yeah. In bankruptcy court, the claim is one page. You know, you could write, you know, ten billion dollars there if you want, but the judge is going to say, "Yeah, you're not getting that." I mean, I'm not sure what claim the IRS even has. I mean, I actually have. Like... Yeah, well, it, it, it happened in. It's basically, it happened in Celsius. So there wasn't there was a chance that if it, if the price went up so much, uh, the equity might be in the money. So then the state regulators, the SEC, and all them come along and say, "We'll put a four point seven billion dollar claim in." Um, and then if there's anything left over, it will just go to the government over equity. Like, I don't, I don't think so because you, again, you can put a, any claim you want. It has to get adjudicated and the judge isn't going to say, oh yeah, well, the IRS wants 50 billion. Let me give the whole, them the whole estate. You know, there has to be a case made as to why they should get, you know, X number of dollars. And those things get punished down to pennies on the dollar. If, if that, you know, usually because people want to put the, the most, amount of money possible on there and the reality is you know they're not owed that much and they're going to get squashed down regardless so again i doubt the equity will ever come to play but you know i, I don't think that just putting a number down in bankruptcy court is is not going to work i mean there's a lot of the other problem bankruptcy is that, like, cases where that happens uh, personally like i'm going through it right now with like the account i had on there and like they say that their records do not match what we're showing. It's like, yeah, because y'all were doing double accounting. Of course, your records aren't right at all. So, I mean, that's going to be a problem in and of itself between like getting the balance sheet correct. If I can just jump in here, um, guys, then thanks for uh, for inviting me up. Um, I actually have a little bit of um, indirect experience with the bankruptcy administration process as it relates to FTX. Um, client of mine is um, entangled, let's say. Uh, they had the misfortune of <laughs> getting the uh, the hug of death from uh, SBF and, and FTX and actually Caroline Ellison, um, which huge shout out to Autism Capital while picking up on that one for where did that $3.5 million go and which gambling company did they invest in? Incidentally, I happen to know them. Um, so these guys... Uh, here's like the, the quick and dirty lowdown of it. The assets that are, um, uh, you know, making up all of the intricate web of ridiculous investments, shell companies here, there, left, right, and center, um, are in such a disastrous state that to be able to even make sense of all of the deals and actually account for what even exists and what the bankruptcy administrators can claw back and then what they can then sell and pretty much auction off piece by piece because there's so fucking many of them um, is going to take years. And on top of that, I can absolutely guarantee you that there's going to be a healthy amount of litigation um, related to them because in the particular case that I'm personally familiar with, um, there is 
and and anybody who has ever done a deal like this is going to laugh their fucking ass off right now. Um, there was thirty five million dollars that was wired from an Alameda account, not on the basis of and, and it was you know convertible non recourse loan by the way to a shell company uh, that was uh, was made on the basis not of loan documents but of a fucking term sheet there was an eight figure sum wired and secondarily the next tranche that was sent across was over three million dollars straight from caroline ellison's personal account her own individual account uh on the basis of no documents whatsoever so that's just one case out of question mark how many hundreds of investments it's going to take a long time to monetize the assets it's going to take a long time to even just figure out where the hell they all are so it's it's going to be a long long story it's going to be years in the making um you know before that anybody gets done with anything um, thanks everyone yeah to your point there recently had um asher Gnut from us bitcoin who's been working with celsius to get a new company up called fahrenheit and they've been going through the chapter 11 case and all the assets there for what Celsius had. The interesting thing about Celsius is they had a lot of assets on hand that are actually valuable in the market. Alameda and FTX, they had a lot of trash. Like they had MAPS token and Oxygen token. They had a bunch of Solana, which, you know, still maybe promising. Who knows? Definitely like crashed for a while there. But they didn't have like anything that a lot of these other chapter 11 cases had. So going back to the Celsius one, they had a huge Bitcoin mining operation. They were one of the largest Bitcoin miners in the US, tons of energy contracts around that, tons of different infrastructure. They had a lot of Bitcoin, a lot of ETH on hand. Solana, probably the best thing that the FTX estate had, right? They had FTT, they had MAPS, they had Oxygen, and then they had a whole lot of nothing else. Like their Bitcoin deposits, I remember watching those get drawn down on the glass node uh, during the last few weeks of FTX. Um, and so to your point, Evan, like, and maybe even just like question back to you, what does this really look like when there's no assets besides maybe like future promise price targets for Solana? That seems to be about it. I would, from a position of, uh, of just being outside of uh, uh, the, the orbit from the outside looking in, um, based on what I've discussed as it relates to, to that case, um, my clients are looking at it and saying, Hey, listen, we've got a legal opinion that says we don't have to worry about this. We can essentially litigate, uh, our own assets, um, uh, you know, for years and bankruptcy administrators from FTX are going to get absolutely nothing because the deal was just, it was toast before it was even done in the first instance. Now, when it comes to crypto assets, okay, it's, I mean, the U S government has, has disposed of crypto assets before it's, it's not ideal and they're not really good at doing it, but they've done it before. The question is, okay, can you account for all of it first? You got to you know, basically go and find it. So, I, I don't see it being anything more than just a very long drawn out process that just takes forever for anybody to, to, to get anything from what's going to be left in the end. I, I, I don't have a clear enough picture and I don't think even, even the bankruptcy administrators have a clear enough picture to be able to say, okay, we kind of know where the number is going to come at they come out to uh, on balance in the end i would argue that equity holders um, um, unless somebody comes in with a stupid amount of money at auction for whatever remaining assets are left which i don't see happening i don't i don't know that that there's any value left to the equity like martin was saying it's going to get sold off for pieces where there's any value in in those pieces that's my turn. Yeah, I can, I can talk to it a bit more because I'm I'm one of the top ten creditors in Celsius. Um, so the way that we got around this is we we split everything up. So you had your liquid crypto. Um, so Mashinsky lost fifty percent of all the crypto, and then you've got all the dollar shenanigans. So we ended up with about a thirty-seven percent 
um, crypto distribution, but then you've got the whole dollarized messing around. So you end up less Bitcoin. It was about 25% in the end. So then you've got 75% missing. About another 30% of it was made up with illiquid assets. So um, he borrowed, um, I think, against 47,000 or 67,000 client Bitcoin um, to take out a billion dollar loan and then bought shit tons of ASICs, which have been sat for two years um, gaining dust. And so we're about, we've been trying to get them plugged in. Um, and finally, we got like about 85,000 of 120,000 ASICs plugged in. Um, and then we were actually an investor in the core scientific bankruptcy. So we had a 50, they, Mazinski took 50 million of client money and invested it in core scientific. Um, <clears throat> and then as part of the settlement, we ended up taking over one of their um, one of their operations that will allow us to plug in and, and re- expand from there. Um, so in, in all, we ended up with 30, 30% crypto and I think, sorry, 37% crypto and 30% of illiquid assets, which is going to be a NASDAQ listed company. Um, and they're due to launch it onto NASDAQ next year in order to get out of bankruptcy further. Firstly, they chewed through about 250 million in legal fees and trying to settle with all the different types of creditors. Um, but then they took a bunch of litigation, you know, listed about 200 different causes of actions and put them in a litigation trust. And then they settled with the CFTC, the FTC, um, the SEC, the DOJ and said, right, allow us to exit. We'll give you a $4.7 billion claim. I think it's about $6 billion with all the different state regulators. But put, um, but take all the criminality out of this, and just come after Mijinsky and all the con- the co-conspirators, and then allow the company to emerge from bankruptcy. So, Chapter Eleven, it, it's a horrible process, and it's just a vulture fest for all the the lawyers and professionals and advisors. Um, but in the end, when I compare something like Mount Gox, which took over ten years. Um, the Chapter 11 process can be done in about a year and a half and two years because they've got mechanisms to take. You don't have to resolve everything. You can put it. And so I imagine that FTX would be done by the end of 2024, I think. I, I think in terms um, of... But there were bigger assets in FTX, by the way. Yeah, I, I um, think in terms of speed, is it possible? Absolutely. I think that if anybody were able to be made as whole as you were made in that scenario... In the case of FTX, I would say that would be a miracle. Well, it's ninety. We've we've list, they've listed all the assets in FTX. It's up to ninety percent now. A bunch of it is illiquid. So, you know, if you can't sell the Anthropic shares, then obviously that would make a big difference. And then you've got all of the the shit coins and stuff. But everyone's getting back their NFTs and things like that. And um, they've actually listed out all the assets, like. I actually think FTX claims is a, I mean, don't take this as financial advice. It's a liquid. These things are really risky and you can get scammed just in the chapter 11 process. Essentially, chapter 11 has found out a way of doing what SBF did, but legally where they can just spend client money, um, but they can do it uh, under the under the, the guidance of the court. Um, actually, it's a uh, horrific post, process. I actually posted up above on, on chain data about, most of the known assets that they still have. And then you could see the recent transactions where they started moving some of their crypto the past month after they got that approval to liquidate like a hundred million. But one of the amazing things John Ray did is he immediately like just went straight in to come after some of the, the settling on the like really large cases. Um, also, uh, SBF invested a billion dollars in um, a big mining company, actually a, a more valuable mining company than in the Celsius case. There's a bunch of shit that, that's still in there. So it's, um, the you know, SBF's biggest issue uh, was uh, he was, um, you know, doing the whole uh, having instant demand deposits, but also making these, uh, you know, multi-billion or multi-hundred million dollar loans where they could demand them instantly and then put a bunch of the money into uh, you know, private equity and things that could be worth zero that are highly risky. Um, and then obviously just all the exorbitant spending to try and buy governments and regulators and uh, influencers and celebrities. 
um, which chewed through a few billion, and then also had to obviously do um, settle with uh, Binance, who ultimately was the person that, that pulled the plug and made, led to their demise. I think he's innocent. Get him out of there. I want to welcome Big God to the stage. He's been here for a second, but good to see you. Thanks for jumping up as co-host. A uh, few more people jumped up on stage as well. Feel free to jump in if you want to add your two cents to the situation. We've kind of gone through everything. We had uh, March Crowley up here earlier going through like what SBF is going to expect going to prison first day uh, and the types of penitentiaries he could be placed at. Then we went through like what his parents were going to face, the co-conspirators who pled guilty already, what they're going to face. Um, and then we've talked about all the other chapter 11s have been going on on as well. So, uh, Mariana, I see your hand up. Yes. Hi. Um, you know, I think the political uh, fallout is going to be really interesting as we're heading into a, you know, pretty exciting election cycle. We saw the money flows on, you know, to both Democrats and Republicans. And uh, I mean, in New York, we had uh, what David Shore was throwing parties for Richie Torres on uh, SPF's dime. And his brother Gabe uh, was working for sure. So it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, kind of the political fallout from all of this. Yeah, the political fallout for sure. I'm, if you go on Twitter right now and just kind of scroll off of the Spaces app, you'll see so many people just pulling up receipts from different investors. Uh, like Bill Ackman's tweet or Kevin O'Leary. So there's definitely going to be a, like a lot of name and shame for what has been going on. For I am years. sort of wondering, like, who has the most leverage to use that as an attack? Because there was just money flowed all over the place. Like, I'm pretty sure that they're like Democrats got more, but pretty soon after they uncovered, oh, we sent a bunch to the Republicans too. You're throwing it to both sides. So uh, who knows how that'll be used, but it's going to be definitely a wild card because. I mean, arguably the biggest fraud in, you know, American history. Got to imagine that's that's going to play a part. But I mean, there, there's so many different pieces floating around with the, the Israel Hamas conflict and uh, like what a clown show the election season is going to be. I, I got all my popcorn ready, though. That's for being sure. Everybody, I'm going to jump down now. Thank you very much for hosting this space. Um, personally, like it's a bit of a mixed emotion for me. I don't know if you feel the same. I know some people will be celebrating, but when it comes to people's freedom, there's something that kind of just brings out. Imagine if that happened to you. But I know that it's justice and people need to figure out. But personally, I just can't quite celebrate when someone's losing their freedom. Um, but if this is a, a good moment for you, then congratulations. And um, yeah, it, it looks like the, the bankruptcy is going to actually produce some fruit. So I'm really glad of that because it looked really, really grim at one stage. And um, thanks for everybody for sharing their insights. Absolutely. Building off of that, I mean, there's so many out like outcomes that could come out of this. We were talking earlier about, I mean, it's it's gruesome to say, but I mean, he's if he does go to you know one of these high level penitentiaries, he is not the type of dude that is likely to do well, and he could die. I mean, that's just like one of the possibilities. And if that does happen, I mean, it's going to be a crazy story to look at. What are people going to take away from it? How will it change? What sort of new products come out in the market because people will not want to copy that story obviously it's just going to be it's going to be really wild i think it's going to have a lot of ramifications for the the free market of ideas that people put into the world when they see what can go wrong because for so long it's just been a total clown world where all the regulators are sleeping people could pretty much do whatever they want pump whatever token whatever scam and there's been practically no consequences but this feels like a turning point where that's going to change and there's going to be a lot of new 
thoughts being taken before actions are made by these people with a lot of money. So very interesting. Very happy that spaces now exist because what a cool place to talk about this. And shout out to Will for starting this thing, man. You rock. Hey, Ben, real quick, I don't know if you was here earlier when I mentioned it, but I, I do think that it is a turning point in how, how this stuff goes down because I said earlier, within 24 hours, uh, SPF is uh, convicted. And uh, with, you know, within 20, uh, 24 hours ago, the safe moon devs were indicted and uh, were arrested. So definitely, definitely it's a turning point in how this stuff goes down. Funny how everyone just completely forgot about safe moon. Like I completely spaced out about that whole thing. <laughs> I just didn't even remember that existed as soon as this came out. So, was, and, and that's sort of a testament of it too, to the fact that the dominoes are really starting to fall. I mean, that's, that was literally yesterday, wasn't it? I mean, it's, it's yeah, two days yeah. in a row where these big, big story. I mean, Safe Moon was a big story. Freaking Dave Portnoy coming out and just making this stupid ass video about how he's going all in on Safe Moon. Like this, this real big recognizable names are going to start going down, and the backlash is going to be wild to witness. That's for dang sure. Speaking of moons, it is near bedtime for me. I've been at this for three hours, so. I want to thank everyone for joining. If you are interested in still talking about this, I'm sure someone else will boot up another space. But see you guys around next time. Thanks for joining. Lots of good conversations. Peace. Okay, Appreciate you, you for spinning this up, Meow. Will. Have a good uh, one, everybody. Yeah, SPF everybody. did nothing wrong. Please free him. Meow. <laughs> thank you. Good night. Safe moon. Uh, so I hope that was useful. Um, you know, I'm always uh, going off onto Twitter spaces quite randomly. Uh, there's just so much going on right now, uh, trying to make sure that I keep everyone up to date with all the different things. Um, as I said, there's wearing multiple hats at the moment on the bank to the future side um, as a financial commentator um, and also what I consider to be a tragic situation with the escalating war on the geopolitical side and how that all relates to finance, building and protecting your wealth. Um, so if you'd like more content like this, uh, make sure you subscribe. I give little shorts one minute. Uh, I give uh, live broadcasts. I upload AMAs and spaces. Um, so make sure you follow me on Twitter um, or you subscribe to this channel and hit that like button. Put a comment below and let me know what you thought about the uh, SPF uh, scenario. And uh, as always, um, you are alive at one of the most interesting and exciting times in financial history. Uh, some are going to get absolutely wrecked, as we are seeing. Others are going to do really well. And I want to make sure that you are on the right side of that change. We do it with peace. We do it with love. We do it with unity. And I'll see you in the next broadcast. Peace. Peace.